Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament. Direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Are there any statements? The member for Wentworth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I arise this morning to talk about important election commitments I secured from the former coalition government for my own electorate of Wentworth. <laughs> the first was a 110,000 <coughs> commitment to improve traffic safety at the intersection of Glenmore Road, Cascade and Hampton Streets, Paddington. I listened to concerns from local residents who had identified this intersection as a notorious traffic blocks black, black spot. The second was a commitment to help reduce crime and combat theft, vandalism, graffiti and other antisocial behaviour around Wallara. In 2006, I hosted a community roundtable to improve the safety of our local area with a strong focus on removing graffiti. It was clear that the key to graffiti prevention is rapid removal, here, here. but that needs to be resourced, and so after hearing the views from police, local government and the community, I was successful in securing funding of $150,000. The third and final commitment was for a communal uh, kitchen at Bondi designed to bring needy families and local charities together over a meal. The Our Big Kitchen project at the Yeshiva Centre in Bondi is a fully functioning commercial kitchen where local charities and volunteers can store, prepare and serve meals to help feed hungry people and people aff affected by emergencies in the community. Mr Speaker, just because the government has changed, the needs of my community have not, and I urge the Prime Minister, who I note is not with us today, to support these important local initiatives. The member for Fowler. The proposal of the New South Wales government to privatise parts of the electricity industry has alarmed many consumers as well as employers of electricity generators and suppliers. Consumers have little confidence that electricity prices would fall if privatisation goes ahead when experience in other states with private generators shows that prices are higher for average consumers. Under this proposal, there is no guarantee that the private sector will build a new generating plants. New South Wales will not have sufficient power by 2015. Mr Speaker, workers in the power industry are rightly concerned for the security of their jobs. Interstate experience has shown some suppliers have cut their workforce by half. In one case, 500 call centre jobs were outsourced to India. And there is great concern that overseas owners will gain control of our power industry. Mr Speaker, in 1946, the long-serving Conservative Premier of South Australia, Tom Playford, could not get the private electricity supplier to extend services to new growth areas of the state, so he nationalised the industry. Those governments who today seek to sell the people's power assets may someday find themselves in the same position. And I call on Premier Yemma to listen to the voices of the people of New South Wales. The member for Dunkley. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On this RDO, the Rudd Day Off, I'd like to point to a number of issues that were raised during the election campaign yeah, yeah. where commitments were secured from the Howard government if it was to be re-elected. I'm sad that the Minister for Sport isn't here to be able to hear about a number of those, but I hope to uh, follow up my advocacy with correspondence with her. There are a number of issues that were raised of great importance to the local community. The new basketball facility at the Mornington Secondary College was needing some enhancements for traffic movement and pedestrian movement, given the vast number of families that do attend that venue. 
we secured commitments in relation to the Ballon Park Athletics Complex so that it could host regional, state and, in, and where we could secure the opportunity national athletics events. We also looked to the Eric Bell Reserve in Frankston North to support the redevelopment of its facilities, a long time coming and something that a re-elected Howard government was committed to do. And also at, at Lang Warren, that rapidly growing area out at Lang Warren, where you see Lloyd Park, one of the key and one of the only focal points for activity for young people, a growing number of young people, again, a Howard government commitment to help with that redevelopment. What was noticeable in the Dunkley campaign was the stealth-like campaign that the ALP ran trading on the cult of Kevin. We heard nothing from the local candidate, nothing from the central campaign, in fact nothing from any Labor advocate in the area about any of these projects. I can only assume that that was a ringing endorsement of these projects, order, projects order, that should be carried forward time by has the Rudd government. The member for Canberra. Mr Speaker, I want to talk to the House this morning about the absolutely successful and wonderful a uh, national multicultural festival that was held here in Canberra between the 8th and the 17th of February. And I want to remind members in the House that I ensured that each member of this place received a copy of the program for the festival so that they could in fact be aware of the multicultural facets of this city uh, that I live in and many others do as well. I want to congratulate the ACT Minister for Multicultural Affairs, John Hargraves. I want to very much congratulate the artistic director of the festival, Dominic Miko, who has drawn together a, a marvellous program and a very successful festival which has been held. Over 170,000 people are estimated to have packed oh, eight days of events with a very large and comprehensive program. And I have to say that the um, uh, Tradies, Dixon Club, Tradies Club of Dixon, the Hellenic Club in Woden were both very major sponsors of the, um, of the festival. And I want to make particular mention of the Al Noir Wal Al Amal Orchestra from Egypt, a partially sighted group of women, most of them with no sight at all, in fact, just on 50 of them, who travelled here successfully and just wowed audiences with their wonderful musical talent. And they are to be applauded. <laughs> We are very, very proud here in Canberra of the way we live and demonstrate a very successful and very cohesive multicultural community. Order. The honourable member's time has expired. The member for Macmillan. Thank you, Mr. I wasn't expecting the call, but uh, as I have now the call, I bemoaned yesterday in this House, Mr. Speaker, and it was noted that the aged care minister outrageously misled this House on the record of the Howard government in aged care. From the very beginning of the government in 1996, when the constraints were put on this government, on that government, because of the government that had gone before and the debt we inherited, it was the Peter Costellos of this world that grabbed hold of that budget and enabled the Australian people to get the aged care that they required. Order. And in fact, there was, there was tripling of the spending on aged care over the 11 years of the Howard government that changed the lives of families and places right across this nation. And I will not for one minute in this House step back from the great record of the Howard government and aged care, and it's, up, and it's because of Peter Costello and the work that he did in those early years that set this government up for the Rolls-Royce service they have today. You will be struggling, Minister, just Order. to service your portfolio. Do not put down the work that was done by the Howard government. The member for Franklin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to congratulate the Tasmanian Tigers cricket team for getting into the final of the Ford Ranger Cup tomorrow. Yeah. The uh, final of the competition, Mr Speaker, is going to be played at Bell Reeve Oval in my electorate against the Victorian Bush Rangers. The uh, Tassie Tigers have had a tough year in the four-day version of the game after their win in the Pura Cup last year, yeah. but they've been the team to beat so far in the one-day competition. Yeah. Approximately 7,000 people are expected to attend the final tomorrow at Bell Reeve Oval, and I'd like to urge many more Tasmanians to get behind their local team and go to the cricket tomorrow. I'd like to wish Captain Dan Marsh, the Vice Captain George Bailey, and the rest of the Tigers the best of luck tomorrow. I do hope to be able to join them at Bell Reeve Oval for a brief time tomorrow to cheer them on. Thank you. Yeah. The member for Patterson. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, Mr. Speaker, I raise an important point on behalf of my constituency. I'm glad the Minister for Health is here because this week she's committed a fraud upon the people of Maitland. Mr. Speaker, prior to the election, the Howard government had announced a tender for an MRI licence covering Newcastle and the Hunter. And having lived there for well and truly over a decade now, let me say Maitland is a part of the Hunter. They committed to an MRI licence specific for Maitland, the and for today Patterson. they have. The member for Patterson will resume. The minister on a point of order. Yes, on a point of order, I ask the speaker whether it is parliamentary to accuse a minister of fraud, order and whether that minister, can be done the in order, a order, the minister, order. The members will resume their seat. Minister, will resume their seat. I will listen carefully to what the member for Paterson is saying. The member for Paterson. Mr. Speaker, the reality is that the Minister for Health has committed a fraud upon the people of Maitland in not offering them directly the MRI licence that was promised to them during the election. What they have done is put one word in a statement, withdrawn the tenders, and that is not acceptable. Our people want the MRI licence, Mr. Speaker. She promised it, and today she is refusing to honour that promise to the people of Paterson and the seat of Hunter. And I ask her today to honour that commitment, to deliver that licence to the people as you promised. Yeah. The member for Highmarsh. This place and to congratulate uh, the Community Tribune, a uh, Greek language newspaper that services and keeps the uh, South Australian. Greek community uh, informed in South Australia. Mr Speaker, tomorrow night I'll be attending a, uh, a dinner being organised by the Greek Tribune to commemorate 15 years since they first went to print. And uh, I take this opportunity, as I said, to congratulate them and uh, to wish them well uh, for tomorrow night. Uh, it is South Australia's only Greek language newspaper and it keeps the uh, Greek community in South Australia informed. We all know how important it is to be informed. We all know how important it is that, uh, to be informed through the media, which makes people feel uh, connected to their community. It, uh, the Greek Community Tribune lets people know what's happening locally, what's happening on an international scale, and certainly uh, lets them know of all the community events. Um, the uh, Greek uh, Tribune was found by a, uh, a gentleman uh, from the Riverland, Mr Peter Pyros, who still runs the paper today. Uh, it also, uh, I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate Peter for the magnificent work that he does. He's dedicated to ensuring that uh, every edition is printed and uh, delivered on time for, no little, for very little reward. It's a passion that Peter has and uh, through many ups and downs he stood by the paper and ensured that it's printed and uh, distributed across South Australia to keep readers informed and informing the uh, community well, the it does. The member's time has expired. The member for Herbert. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Mr. Speaker, how in these modern times could Soviet-style collectives still exist in Australia? <laughs> I, I have one in my electorate, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's called Palm Island. It's an indigenous community, and, and we must do something about the land ownership issues that exist on Palm Island. The solution to indigenous issues in Australia are the three L's: leadership land ownership, law, order and governance. Without those three solutions, Indigenous Australia will never move forward. It's very important when you go to Palm Island and you see that people can't own their own little piece of Australia, they can't build their own house, they can't deal in their house. And, and, well, well, I'm going to answer that question. Well, I've been talking to this, the Queensland Government for five years. Queensland government who can change the deed of grant in trust arrangements to fix those beautiful people on Palm Island. And I'm disappointed that Labor has been so wishy-washy on this issue. I demand that Aboriginal Australia be able to own their own piece of Australia. The member for Petrie. I acknowledge the importance of looking after our environment. That is why I wish to acknowledge the hard work of the Redcliffe and District Wildlife Rescue. This organisation assists in the rescue, rehabilitation and release of sick, injured and orphaned wildlife. The organisation is also getting youth involved by running a junior wildlife carers program, which involves visiting schools in Redcliffe and surrounding areas and running information sessions for the different grades. They give the children environmental tips on what they can do to protect our wildlife and what to do if they encounter an injured animal or bird. Today, the Redcliffe and District Wildlife Rescue officially opened their bird rescue centre. 
In December 2007 and January 2008, Brian Krause, their uh, bird carer, received 94 birds and was able to release 100 birds over those two months. The community needs to continue its support for such an important organisation. I commend the organisation for the wonderful work that they do in the community and on the opening of their new centre today. The member for Canning. On this historic RDO Rudd Day Off, I wish to, uh, and I notice, Mr. Speaker, Order as being I, as I look, the time uh, there are the no member ministers on the front bench. Included. Order, the member for Mon Moncrief will receive his seat. Order, I. I present petitions in accordance with Standing Order 207, the clerk. Well, how about that? There are no petitions. <laughs> the member for Moncrief. Mr Speaker, I seek leave to move for a suspension of standing orders. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not granted. Man, under Standing member Order 47, Mr Speaker. I move that so much of standing and sessional orders be suspended as would prevent me from moving the following motion. At 12 p.m. each and every Friday that this House sits, the Speaker shall interrupt the business before the House and call on questions without notice for a period of one hour and 30 minutes. Mr Speaker, this is an important suspension Order, of standing the orders. Secretary. I move that the member no longer be heard. Order. The question is... Order. The member for Moncrief will resume his seat. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. In accordance with Standing Order 133, the division is deferred until the commencement of the next sitting. Is the motion seconded? If the Leader of the Nationals wants to observe what's going to happen, he won't behave like that. The Member for North Sydney. Mr Speaker, I refer you in the first place to section 125 of the Standing Orders that says if the Speaker's opinion is challenged by more than one member, the question must be decided by division of the House and then followed on by section 133b, a division called for on a Friday shall be deferred until the commencement of the next sitting unless otherwise ordered. Now, Mr Speaker, this is a very important issue. It goes to the heart of a parliamentary democracy, and it is about the right of this side of the House to ask questions of ministers and the Prime Minister when the House no, no, sits. No, that's, that's and this, excuse this, me. Excuse and me. Mr Speaker. Order the honourable member for North Sydney resume his seat. The Chief Government Whip is not helping. The, the point of order is about the deferral of the division. The division is about whether the member can continue his remarks. It's not an invitation in the point of order to then go and debate the substance of the motion that no, 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 for the suspension of standing orders. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, there is a specific no, 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 no. You haven't got the, the call yet. The member for North Sydney. Mr. Speaker, there is a specific provision in section 133B that if, in your opinion, a division can be held, then it can be held. It says, unless otherwise ordered. That means that you, as a speaker, have the capacity to order division, notwithstanding the other provisions in section 133. And I ask you to consider the fact that we are ready to do business here. For, we want a division. The member for North Sydney resume his seat. I have ordered as I've ordered. That is my ruling. The member for Cowper. I second, I second the motion. I reserve my right to speak. The question, the question is that the motion for suspension of standing orders be agreed to. All those of that. The member for Patterson. Mr. Speaker, the previous motion for the member to no longer be heard is not resolved. It's not resolved because there has been no vote taken and counted. So, therefore, Mr. Speaker. The member for Moncrief has the right to continue his speech. I have, called, I have called for the seconder. The member for Cowper. I second the motion, Mr Speaker. It's vitally important that we have question time at any stage during the parliament. The member will resume his seat. 
Mr. The Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I move that the member no longer be heard. Order. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. Yes. Division required. Yes. In accordance with Standing Order 133, the division is deferred until the commencement of the next sitting. The, the, qu the member for North Sydney with a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I move to send in your ruling. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, under the provisions of section 133B of the standing orders, it is clear that you have the capacity to order the division of this House, Mr. Speaker. This place is turning into a farce because, specifically, the government has failed to make the Prime Minister and Ministers accountable to this House and accountable to the Australian people for their actions. This is not the way we want to behave in the parliament. But if you are going to close down the parliament, if the Labor Party is going to try close down accountability, if they are going to close down transparency, then we make no apology, Mr Speaker, no apology at all for calling for question time to come on. And Mr Speaker, it is very important that the member for Moncrief well, had a voice for, in this House for his member, constituents. The member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The Leader of the House. I move that the Speaker be no longer heard. Order. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All of those opi that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Second, is the motion of division required? In accordance with Standing Order 133, the division is deferred until the commencement of the next sitting. The Leader of the Nationals. Mr Speaker, be because there has been no completed division, the, the, the issue is not resolved, and therefore the member has a right to continue speaking. The issue is simply not resolved, and you can't move on to the next item until the, this matter is resolved. The, the member has a right to exercise his entire speaking time because the House has not the, voted that his time is member, completed. The, member, the Leader of the National Party will resume his seat. Basically, this is what the motion is about before the chair. It's what the reason that the dissent is being attempted to be moved. Is the is I have told the leader of the National Party that if he wants to remain around to witness pr proceedings, that he shouldn't be interjecting. Is the motion seconded? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This is an embarrassing farce on the part the of the Leader government. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will resume his, her seat. The Deputy Leader will resume her seat. The Leader of the House. I move the member be no longer heard. Order. The question is that the member be no longer heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. Oh, sorry. The Members will resume their seats as is required by the standing orders. The member for Flinders will resume his seat. The member for Lyons isn't assisting. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All those of that opinion will say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Yes. In accordance with Standing Order 133, the division is deferred until the commencement of the next sitting. The question now is that the motion moved by the member for North Sydney be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the ayes, the noes have it. Aye. Ayes have it. Division required. In accordance with Standing Order 133, the division is deferred until the commencement of the next sitting. The member for Moncrief. Speaker, 
further to the motion that I moved earlier. This is an absolute disgrace. Order. The member for Moncrief to resume his seat. The clerk. Private members' business notice number one: organ donation. The member for Moncrief on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I have a right as a member of this parliament to continue moving the motion. I've moved the order. motion, and this the was not for successfully for gained because I was not in the situation. The member for Moncrief will resume his seat. 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 The member for Moncrief will leave the chamber under Standing Order 94A for one hour. The member will leave the chamber for one hour under Standing Order 94A because of the gross disorderly conduct of the member. I ask the sergeant to remove the member I ask the sergeant to remove the member The member for North Sydney. Mr Speaker, it has always been the case, in accordance with the standing orders, if the member was going to be removed from the chamber, the member, member had North to be Sydney. named. Member for North Sydney. He had to be named. The member for North Sydney to resume his seat. The clerk. Private member's business the clerk. Has... The, clerk. the member for Lyons. The member for Warringa. Standing orders. Under the standing orders, the member for North Sydney was raising a point of order. You are obliged, under the standing orders, to hear him out, and it was quite improper for, for you. Quite improper for you. The member for Warringa will resume your seat. The member for Warringa will resume your seat. The member for Warringa will remove himself from the chamber under 94A for one hour. The clerk. Private members' business notice number one: organ donation. The member for Macmillan on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, having regard to this of this Mike occasion and what might happen, yeah. I ask, member for Macmillan has I the ask, call. I, right, I, sorry, I ask the no, no, no. clerk. The no, no. member for Whether Macmillan should have his microphone on. I asked the clerk prior to this day, prior to this day, whether the sergeant, whether the sergeant would remove. Or the member for Macmillan doesn't have the call. Actually, the no. The member for Macmillan was in his seat. Now, yeah, I appreciate I did, and uh, it was an error because he's not in his place. Now, if I'm if I'm being asked to act honourably. I will try to uphold the standing orders. And I apologise to the, those with the microphone switch. The member for Macmillan. Speaker, because of this, uh, I uh, thought that this occasion may come to what has happened today. I asked the clerk whether the sergeant would remove anybody from this House, and the answer I got was a very unlikely no, they would not. I think the member for Moncrete has been thrown out improperly. It's I asked the member for Macmillan, is that a reflection on the chair or not? I have never reflected on the chair. Well, it was, the honourable member will resume his seat. The member, for, the member for North Sydney. Can you advise me, Mr Speaker, under what standing order the clerk, the sergeant in arms, remove the member for Moncrief? The authority of the speaker and on precedent. Go back and read, 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 practice. The honourable member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for Fremantle. Mr. Speaker. The member for Fremantle has the call. 
I move the motion relating to organ donation in the terms in which it appears in the notice paper. What a disgrace. On this for free, first Michael. historic opportunity on a Friday for members to bring forward and discuss matters of significance within their electorates and within the Australian community. The member for Fremantle will resume her seat. The member for Boothby with a point of order. Mr Speaker, I draw your attention to page 524 of the House of Representatives' practice, in which it said, if the Speaker determines there is an urgent need to protect the dignity of the House, he or she can, can order a grossly disorderly member to leave the chamber immediately. When the member has left, the speaker, when the member has left, the speaker must immediately name the member and put the question for suspension without a motion being necessary. Mr. Speaker, I draw your attention to House, House of Reps practice. The member for Fremantle. I'd like to begin by noting that this is Organ Donor Awareness Week and by acknowledging the many Australians who have made the generous and selfless act of registering as an organ donor. They are making a personal contribution to the collective good health of their fellow Australians. Mr Speaker, I draw, I draw your attention. Mr Speaker, I draw your attention to page 524 of the House of Represent Representative Practice, right, the, where it the member, says— The member it, for Boothby will resume his seat. The member for Boothby will resume his seat. The member for Boothby will The member for Boothby will resume his seat. The member for Boothby should resume his seat. I name the honourable member for Moncrief. The Leader of the House. Thank you. I move that the member be suspended from the House. Order. The question is that the member be suspended from the services of the House. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required? In accordance with Standing Order 133, the division is deferred until the commencement of the next sitting. Order. 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 The member for Boothby does not have the call yet. I, I might, you, you might now repeat it again. The member for Boothby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, House of Representatives Practice, page 524. If the, the, the question has not been resolved, if the question is resolved in the negative, the member may return to the chamber. And I ask you, Mr. Speaker, to use your discretion to put the motion. In accordance with. Or standing order 133, I have deferred the division. The member for Pierce. Mr. Speaker, if the order, the chair will be resumed in 15 minutes.
order. Before proceeding, I simply call upon the, the House uh, to reflect on its ability to conduct itself in a dignified manner. I appreciate that, as a consequence of the standing orders that were agreed to last week, that there are people in the House that feel aggrieved and that, as a demonstration of their frustration, uh, the events of the, this morning have transpired. I would just ask the House to consider that there are motions that have been put forward by both sides of the House to be discussed, and I call upon the House to allow that, those proceedings to continue. In that case, I would then call the member for Fremantle. The reality is, however, that in 2007 across Australia, fewer than 700 organs were donated from only 198 donors. As it currently stands in Western Australia, there were 19 donors last year, and I've been advised that there's only been one donor so far in 2008, and that occurred at the Fremantle Hospital. It's been recognised for some time that Australia's rate of organ donation at 10 donors per million of population is at the lower end of the international scale compared with countries like Spain with a rate of 35 per million and the US with 21.5 per million. What is of particular concern is the fact that the number of donors per year has shown negligible growth between 1989 and the present. According to the figures of the Australian and New Zealand Organ Donation Registry, there were 231 donors in 1989, which is the highest figure recorded, and only 198 last year. The lowest annual figure was 183, recorded in 1994. That was the year, incidentally, when, as the solicitor in charge of the Bunbury Community Legal Centre, I wrote an article for my local newspaper regarding the issue of organ donation, not from a legal perspective but from a human one. I had become aware that each year thousands of Australians were dying or suffering blindness or the debilitating experience of being hooked up to a dialysis machine for several hours every few days for want of healthy organs, a situation that appeared entirely preventable. I later became aware that the shortage of organs is a universal problem. In my work with the United Nations in Kosovo, while chairing a working group on trafficking in persons, I learned of the horrifying international trade in organs and the phenomenon of transplant tourism. A December 2007 World Health Organization report has noted that potential organ recipients from countries including Australia, Canada, Israel, Japan, Saudi Arabia and the USA travel abroad to undergo organ donation from live kidney and liver donors from such countries as Pakistan, India, Bolivia, Brazil, Iraq, Moldova, Peru and Turkey. On another aspect of the international organ trade, the WHO report noted that in China around 12,000 kidney and liver transplants were performed in 2005, with most of the transplanted organs alleged to have been procured from executed prisoners. Many operations involved non-Chinese citizens as organ recipients. The WHO and other bodies have raised concern about the dangerous consequences of the international organ trade, both for live organ donors, most of whom are coerced into it through extreme poverty or force, and for recipients who may undergo surgery in substandard conditions and may not survive the transplant process. It is an appalling situation when Australians in desperate need of an organ feel they must travel overseas to obtain one. And of course, the majority of Australians in need of an organ, and there are approximately 1,900 people currently on the waiting list, do not travel overseas, but continue to suffer, to wait and to hope here in Australia. It is a matter of general and bipartisan agreement that we need to lift the number of organ donors and the number of successful transplants that ensue. This week being Organ Donor Awareness Week is a perfect opportunity to raise the profile of organ donation and to encourage Australians across the board to consider the generous act of registration and to discuss the issue with their families. I note that Donate West, the West Australian Agency for Organ and Tissue Donation, has this week commenced its Don't Waste Your Wish campaign, the first of its kind in WA. One of the lines in the campaign makes the point that there are some wishes you can't keep to yourself which nicely expresses both sides of the equation here, the selflessness of giving and the magical gift it makes possible. 
In my electorate of Fremantle, a well-known bluegrass musician and local celebrity, Jim Fisher, has been the recipient of a liver transplant. He speaks with a humble awareness of how lucky he has been to receive a liver and that he only had to wait nine months to receive his transplant while he has seen other people die waiting for transplants. Jim is well aware that it is not only the generosity of his donor but also Australia's free public health system that contributed to his being alive today. Jim's recovery after the operation was not immediate. He said he felt like he had been bashed by Mike Tyson for a week after receiving his new liver. But some time later, he was black, back playing music in pubs, parks and festivals around Fremantle and around Australia with his band, The Sensitive New Age Cowpersons. As the band's name and songs such as Daddy Wore a Mullet suggest, Jim is a man who genuinely enjoys life and he is grateful to have had a second chance thanks to an organ donation. I also want to draw attention uh, to the new paired kidney exchange program operating at Fremantle Hospital in the renal unit headed by Professor Paolo Ferrari. The unique aspect of this program is that it matches family members who are incompatible donors with other families who are similarly unable to donate to their loved one. The two families, both in the same situation, literally swap kidneys with the approval of the State Health Minister under amendments made to the Human Tissue and Transplant Act WA. The first paired kidney exchange occurred in October last year. This is the kind of innovative policy that could be extended nationally and would result in a significant lift in the rate of live kidney donations. The West Australian Government is encouraging, encouraging other states to participate in this program. In relation to Indigenous Australians, who are disproportionately represented as far as kidney disease is concerned, there has only been one Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander donor in the last five years. And there are cultural reasons, both ancient and modern, for this. The Royal Perth Renal Department is planning a forum later this year which will address this and other matters. The final point I would like to make, Mr Speaker, is that the urgent issue of organ donation is one in relation to which all states and territories and both sides of this House agree that action must be taken. This week, two new members, the member for Morton and the member for Longman, movingly highlighted this issue in their first speeches. I intend to include a prominent article in my first electorate newsletter about organ donor registration, and I hope other members might consider doing the same. I look forward to working with my colleagues on both sides of this House as we discuss every option to increase the rate of organ donation in Australia. It is most encouraging, and perhaps not well understood, that some 94 per cent of Australians have indicated their support for organ and tissue donation. We now need to convert that very high level of approval into action. Speaker, and uh, can I thank the member for Fremantle for bringing this motion before the House today? It is an important no motion and one we should all take note of. I would also like to offer my congratulations to the member for Fremantle on her election to this place and wish her well in the years ahead. Madam Deputy Speaker, I have often spoken in this place uh, about the need for Australians to register for organ donation, as I believe uh, bipartisan support is required to raise donation rates in Australia. We need to raise awareness in our own communities. We need to understand what organ donation means to so many Australians who are waiting on that list. The gift of life is the ultimate gift and uh, one human being that one human being can give to another. Australians have been receiving life-giving organ and tissue transplants since 1965, and to date more than 30,000 people have received transplants which have saved or enhanced their lives. I think that's an incredible record and something we should uh, move to increase. Though Australia does boast one of the highest transplantation success rates in the world, with kidney transplant survival rates at about 90 per cent in the first year and over 75 per cent in, five, in over five years, and even with that very high success rate, we have an extremely low rate of donation in this country. In fact, Australia has one of the lowest rates of organ and tissue donation among Western countries. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would say to all of those in the House today that is very disappointing and alarming, considering our success rate on donor transplants. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, last year just 198 people became organ donors. Um, and incredibly, from those 198 people, 626 transplants were performed from those donations. I think it says a lot for what one person can do if they put their name on that list. With 1,875 people waiting for an organ transplant in Australia, a person has a ten times greater chance of requiring an organ or tissue transplant than of becoming a donor. We certainly have to turn that around. Spain has the highest rate of organ donation in the developed world, and their level of national support has been achieved through government legislation, professional education and ongoing community awareness programs. The Howard government did announce a national organ donation collaborative um, measures on 19 February 2006, and I'm encouraged to hear that the new Rudd government has committed to continuing this funding through to 2009. This is a great step forward. The National Organ Donation Collaborative educates hospital staff across the country in ways donation rates can be improved and is a great example of social policy that makes me proud to stand in this place. And I would, would like, Madam Deputy Speaker, to quote from the Collaborative Charter um, about the opportunity they talk about in their paper. While donation rates in Australia's major hospitals vary greatly, those with high rates did not achieve them by accident. The practices leading to higher rates can be identified and replicated. Through the, collaborative hospital, through the collaborative, hospitals will form multidisciplinary teams, each to include a donor coordinator, to improve the identification of potential donors. Working closely together, the teams will also lift the conversion rate of potential to actual donors. And I think that's a, that will be a great outcome if we can do that through our hospital systems. Hundreds of Australians every year suffer and die needlessly due to a shortage of organ and, donor, uh, organ and tissue donors. Every donor has the potential to improve the lives of at least 10 people. Organ donation saves lives and tissue donation improves the quality of life. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, as we know, every year we lose hundreds of people because those organs are not available. I would like to quote um, from Senator Gary Humphreys, who made a speech last week here in the theatre um, about Organ Donation Week. And one of the comments he made in his speech, and I quote, every year we burn and bury thousands of perfectly healthy, useful organs, while hundreds of people with serious illnesses die for want of them. For some, the decision to take their organs to the grave is made for religious, social or personal reasons. But for the vast majority of Australians, the decision is not one they will bother to make, nor will they probably even consider. And because of this, people are dying. I think that says it all, Madam Deputy Speaker. We have a huge job ahead of us to educate the Australian public on the importance of becoming an organ donor. I believe that to sign on for organ donation is one of the greatest gifts a person can give, but it is one form of generosity that cannot be spontaneous. Research has shown that more than 90 per cent of Australians support organ and tissue donation, and many people are unaware that simply marking your driver's licence as an organ donor is no longer sufficient to carry out your wishes. The law now requires people to register their consent with the organ donor register. You can register online at www.medicareaustralia.gov.au obtain a registration form from Medicare officers or call Medicare on 1800 777 203. The registration forms that people can fill in I make available in my office, and I certainly talk to constituents about what they can do or how they can become organ donors. And I would encourage everyone in this House today to think about having those forms in their offices and trying to encourage constituents to fill them in. It really is a very important step that we can all take. But I can't stress strongly enough, Madam Deputy Speaker, that if you register, it is a subject you must talk over with your family and your loved ones. 
The most common reason families decline to donate their de deceased relatives' organs and tissues is because they don't know if their relative wished to donate their organs or not. It is not pleasant to talk about death, but in the case of organ donation, forward planning is imperative. Families are placed in a situation where they have to make a heart-wrenching decision when their loved one has just been pronounced dead. Even if someone has registered their wishes on the organ donation register, a family member may still override that wish. But if your family knows and understands your wishes, it will not be such a hard decision for a family to follow through with your wishes when you do pass away. But I would like to stress today, Madam Deputy Speaker, that organ donors are, not, are treated with the utmost respect. The donor body is treated with dignity, and of course that is of huge concern to people putting their names forward as donors. But I have been assured from the people I've spoken to, the, organi the organisation itself, that bodies are treated with the utmost respect and dignity. Organ donation is important, and I very much hope people do not delay to register as soon as possible. Each individual has the potential to help up to 10 people, as I said before, through organ transplants such as heart, lungs, liver, pancreas and kidneys, or tissue transplants such as bone and eye tissue. We need to educate people about organ and tissue donation to encourage families to discuss their wishes, highlight the success of the organ transplantation in Australia and promote the registration of consent through the Australian Organ Donor Register. Each and every one of us will make a difference to someone else's life if we are unfortunate enough ourselves to pass away, but we should make that decision, fill in the form and register as an organ donor. I know in my own electorate I have a wonderful young man called Chris Wells. He was around 37 when he received a heart-lung transplant. Chris couldn't work. He was on oxygen all the time, couldn't walk 50 metres, couldn't put his work boots on because he didn't have the energy to do it. Through his transplant, and it only kept him in hospital for 10 days, Chris is now an active member of the community, works full-time, coaches and plays cricket and, in fact, played for Australia in England as part of our transplant games. So I urge all of my colleagues here today, please talk to your constituents, encourage them to register, and I hope everyone in this House also registers for organ donation. Thank you. The member for Capricornia. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I want to start out um, this morning by congratulating the member for Fremantle um, on uh, making this uh, her very first notice of motion to the House. Uh, this, the the uh, topic of organ, organ donation uh, is an important one uh, every day um, that we come to this place, but uh, particularly this week, which is uh, Organ Donor Awareness Week, uh, it is uh, very timely to, uh, to add our voices uh, to those throughout the community in uh, raising the issue of, uh, of organ donation and uh, encouraging all of our constituents uh, and, and our uh, fellow members of parliament uh, to take the step of registering to be an organ donor. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, at the outset, uh, pay tribute to all of those Australians uh, who have been uh, organ donors in the past, and particularly, of course, um, to their families and loved ones, because it is uh, the families and loved ones uh, who are faced with the, the decision finally uh, whether or not uh, a deceased person will, uh, will be uh, an organ donor, whether they will uh, give that uh, gift of life, give the gift of a second chance uh, to another person that they've never met before uh, and that uh, so many thousands of uh, Australian families have, uh, have made that brave decision, brave and generous decision, uh, to donate organs from their deceased loved one. As we've seen uh, from this debate and uh, other, uh, other statements in the House this week, uh, there is great support for organ donation on both sides of the House. This is a truly uh, bipartisan uh, question. Uh, and there's also great support within the community, which is not, um, not unusual. Australians are a generous and caring and compassionate people. Um, but I guess the thing that we always are surprised about when we uh, attend uh, functions around organ donation or when we uh, enter into these debates uh, in the House uh, is to find out that although 94 per cent of Australians support 
uh, the idea of organ donation, and that's the, that's the figure that's, uh, that's come out of various studies, uh, we're not then taking the step of registering, uh, of consenting to become organ donors. And uh, that, of course, is the, uh, the problem that we as, uh, as policymakers in, uh, in this country have to grapple with. Uh, we've heard before that only uh, in the last year only about 200 uh, deceased people uh, became organ donors, and, uh, but they gave, uh, they gave a second chance uh, to some 626 other Australians. But that still leaves almost 2,000 people uh, on waiting lists at the end of last year. 2,000 people who are sitting there waiting for every phone call uh, or wondering if, if every time the phone rings, uh, this is going to be their chance uh, at a, or their second chance at life. So we still have a lot more to do. Um, of course, Australia, as I say, Australia has the uh, has that spirit of generosity, uh, but we still have a very low rate of organ donation when compared to other countries. Um, I became aware of this issue. I'm, a, I'm ashamed to say, I guess, that I only became aware of this issue a couple of years ago. Uh, even though I've been uh, in this house for a long time, a family came to see me uh, to share their story with me uh, of, of, being, uh, of being on a waiting list, of what it was like um, to not be able to participate fully in life and to be waiting uh, to see whether or not uh, they would uh, get the, uh, the extra time in their life. I'm pleased to say that that family did have a happy ending and uh, their daughter has uh, since been a, a successful transplant recipient. Uh, but since then, I've taken a great interest uh, in this matter, and I'm pleased to see uh, that in that time there has been a lot of activity uh, by governments, both state and federal, and that governments have been working to address the low rate of organ donation uh, in this country. Of course, uh, it began under the previous government, um, under the, uh, the minister uh, when Tony Abbott was the minister, uh, in setting up the National Clinical Task Force on Organ and Tissue Donation. Uh, and this week, uh, during Organ Donation Awareness Week, uh, that task force re reported uh, its findings. Uh, I might just note that in the past I have uh, called for the government to consider um, the idea of an opt-out system in Australia, but I note that the task force has not followed that, uh, has not followed that path. Uh, and I can accept that because I do, I do realise that the, uh, the evidence on opt-out regimes um, is very mixed. Um, we see Spain. Uh, Spain attributes some of uh, their success in organ donation rates to an opt-out system, but then the U.S. is the second highest, uh, has the second highest donation rate, and it does not use that system. Uh, I, in the time I've got left, I just want to urge uh, everyone uh, here to do what we can to uh, promote, promote the organ donation uh, in, uh, in our communities and uh, to urge all Australians to Members register their consent on the organ expired. donation register. The member for Cowan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, so I'd like to start by uh, saying that I appreciate the opportunity to rise and speak in support of the motion today on organ donation. As a father, a husband, uh, a son and a brother, and in general terms obviously a member of Australian society, I certainly feel this responsibility very clearly to be uh, an organ donor myself. And uh, It's on my driver's licence, we're on the register, uh, and these are the things that need to occur in all our lives. <clears throat> It's, uh, it's almost strange. Uh, you know, I struggle with uh, the reasons why uh, there aren't more people on the register and uh, that the donation rates aren't actually higher. But uh, hopefully now through weeks like this and uh, motions such as this and the commitment of uh, uh, MPs and other members of uh, society that we will uh, see a, an increase, an improvement. Certainly on a daily basis there's a need for organ donation to restore hope for people afflicted by uh, injuries, diseases or genetic causes. And while it's easy for each of us to uh, think of those images of uh, someone laid up in a hospital bed or almost unable to move, laid up at home, uh, I think it's also important that you know, none of us exist in isolation. And each of those people also have families around them. Sometimes uh, those people uh, are the carers or the providers that have been laid up uh, or, or are suffering in these cases. Uh, they have a place in the lives of children, parents, older people, uh, friends, and all that is at risk if we don't get things like organ donation right. And so the point there is that uh, none of us exists in isolation. There are downstream consequences uh, and that uh, 
you know, we, <coughs> in considering organ donation, all members of Australian society should think about uh, uh, not just that person laid up in the high, high profile look there, uh, but what effect of saving that person or giving that person a higher quality of life will have for the families, the kids and those others affected by the circumstances. So, on a uh, slightly more positive note uh, as well, uh, obviously these matters are grave and we have responsibilities, uh, but uh, I'd also like to uh, draw the House's attention to the fact that uh, between the 5th and the 10th of October in Perth, we're fortunate enough to have the 11th Australian Transplant Games running. Uh, they take place every two years, uh, some of which are in the, uh, the member for Fremantle's electorate and others in the member, other events in the member for Swan's electorate. Uh, and they have a range of games and sports, from God's own sport rowing and running, uh, down to uh, sorry, not down, moving on to a lesser uh, end of the scale at uh, chess and Scrabble. And uh, while I guess these indicate that uh, organ donation and transplants can result in uh, someone returning to a full life of opportunities and capacity, perhaps. Maybe we're just getting to the point to keep somebody alive, and so that they might not end up with uh, being able to run marathons or, or things like that. But it is still a great thing for somebody to uh, be able to carry on and remain part of their family's lives and those people around them, their lives. So I think I look upon it as that yeah, hope can be restored, and that there is a life after great adversity. Uh, if we get these things right and we get organ donation right. Now, as uh, others have uh, alluded to and uh, said very clearly, in fact, that uh, obviously leadership is required, not just advocacy, but demonstrated commitment. It needs to be on our driver's licences. It needs to be on the organ donation register. We need to cover these points with our families. I've spoken to my wife about it. She's clear on it. I've spoken to my mother about it. She's clear on it. And my parents-in-law. Everybody knows that my wife and I, what our wishes are, and that should the worst come to the worst, we'll want to be there for somebody that needs it. So I endorse the motion, and I urge all present today and those that note this motion, whenever they might read it, uh, that they take the necessary steps to get on the register, speak to the families, speak to your families. This is our responsibility and we cannot and should not avoid it. The member for Canberra. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting De Deputy Speaker. And I, I just have to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, congratulations on the, your elevation to the position. I want to thank the member for Fremantle for putting this motion on the paper this morning, and I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to speak to it. And I want to speak about some personal cases where we've seen an impact um, on the subject that we're talking about. I first of all want to refer to a very timely letter to the editor that appeared in the Canberra Times this morning from David Mitchell of Warramanga, who I don't think I've met, but I do want to talk about his letter to the editor this morning and in part very quickly quote from it. In part, my son John died suddenly at age 17. As a family group, we had previously discussed what we would do if any of us died suddenly, and we all agreed that we would like our organs donated to save other people's lives. So in the midst of shock and despair, we were able to inform the hospital that John's perfectly good organs were available for transplant. What followed was the arrival of the transplant coordinators who quietly discussed what was going to happen with us and we agreed to go ahead. At all times, the transplant coordinator kept contact with us and showed care and concern for our feelings. We found out later that John's organs had saved five other people. Yes, uh, we miss him every day and suffer the loss and feel the despair of losing him still. We are consoled that part of him lives, lives on in the people that he saved. I urge everyone to sign up to donate their perfectly good organs when they leave this world. And I thank Mr Mitchell for having the um, energy and the foresight to send such an insightful letter to the Canberra Times. Madam, Madam Speaker, I also want to speak about a very dear friend of mine, Justice Terry Connolly, who sadly died very, very suddenly last year uh, of a heart attack. He was only 49 years of age and in the prime of his life. He was actually fit and healthy um, and had always made and was continuing to make 
a significant contribution to our community here. Very sadly, he died of a very, very sudden heart attack, as I said, at age 49. He was looking forward to seeing his two daughters grow and to grow old with his wife, Helen. When Terry died, his wife, Helen, and his two daughters, Lara and Maddie, consented to having Terry's corneas donated. This followed from a previous family discussion about organ donation and the decision to register as organ donors. Helen says she and Terry made the decision to donate their organs because they felt it was something they should do as responsible partners and parents. And Helen says that through the experience of Terry donating his corneas, that some tangible good had come from the time of deep sadness for the family. The fact that through Terry's death, someone was alleviated from their pain and suffering brought them some semblance of comfort and some sense of meaning of his death. Madam Deputy Speaker, at the other end of this debate, we have people who are waiting. And I want to talk about 10-month-old Cordelia Vance, who lives in Canberra. And Cordelia's rare liver condition has prevented her from reaching any milestone that other babies of her age would automatically reach. Now, she and her family, or her family, have had stories in the press in the last few days about Cordelia's circumstances. A dear little possum with an older daughter named Octavia. Uh, the family desperately need to see a liver come their way. I also want to talk about Mrs. Carl Lambert, a, a woman of older years who is hooked to an oxygen machine for 24 hours a day with a rare lung disease. I've met her many times. She's a local person in Canberra, and she is desperately wanting to see a um, transplant arrangement for herself so that her life can also continue. Madam Deputy Speaker, when we look at these two particular angles of this uh, human story, one, where people are awaiting, and two, where we see the success when that wait actually is a successful outcome. We see every reason why every one of us have no excuse, really, other than for the accepted reasons, to actually register for donor organisation. From my part, like other members in this, like in this place, I send out a community newsletter to my electorate to 72,000 households. The next edition is going out in two weeks. And I've decided that there will be a tear-out page in that newsletter of the enrolment form with reasons on the other side as to why I want people to fill it out. I'm very hopeful that they will. The statistics that have been demonstrated by the pe uh, previous speakers to me this morning, the stories that I have repeated here this morning from the human side, really make it very difficult to understand why those the with other than religious problems can't fill those forms expired. out. The member for Flinders. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, in speaking in support of this motion in relation to organ donor awareness, this is a motion ultimately about families who lose people and families who gain people. For me, it is all too personal. In 1992, my 25-year-old cousin Christopher lost his life to a skiing accident. For some days, he was on life support, and during that time, my uncle, uh, whom I love very dearly, David Hunt, and who's perhaps one of my harshest uh, critics and challengers, had to make a very powerful decision, and that was to release the organs of his young son. And it has been a very difficult period for David since then, but the one sustaining element that he has had is that these organs, which were taken from his son and my cousin, gave life to many people. And not all were taken. There was a decision that the corneas were too personal, but that the principal organs were taken. They gave life, and I cannot tell the House to how many people, but I know to a significant number. And that story is the story that occurred 189 198 times around Australia last year. Christopher's story is the story from the side of the donors. And it has never been easy for my uncle or for our family. But the fact that there was some good and a profound good which came from this passing and this process means to me that it is one of the most significant things which anybody in our society can do 
and that is to make the commitment at an early stage to be an organ donor. I also want to focus on the side of the recipients. There's been a young girl, Zoe Wood, a two-year-old girl from Mount Martha. I am also the father of a two-year-old girl who lives in Mount Martha, and so I was in close contact with the family. Zoe needed uh, an organ transplant in order to save her life, and she was fortunate to receive that. And she has two loving parents and three older siblings, and they have back the this beautiful little girl. They have back the hope of a unified family. They have back the life before them and all the glory that comes with it of having a two-year-old with a real future in front of her. And that little girl, Zoe Wood, will be the face of the Royal Children's Hospital Appeal this year. And that is because of the magnificent work of the hospital and the generosity of another family who sadly lost their own child. This brings me to the question of the medical staff who give their time and who give the wonderful expertise. My wife is a neurosurgical nurse. Uh, Paula has done much work in transplant surgery. And so we have, in a strange way, been surrounded by this issue as donors, as a family, uh, as uh, being close to recipients and as somebody who's been engaged in the transfer. And I think it is very important to pay tribute to the extraordinary medical staff who have a sense of hope and belief and purpose in their work, who make life possible. They face tragic loss across the operating table and at the same time they have this extraordinary opportunity to bring a sense of life and hope to those who are facing loss. So I want to conclude by saying that I think that we do need to examine the way in which the magnificent organ donor registry works. We have to examine whether there should perhaps be an opt-out system, or if not that, I would urge the House and all those responsible to consider whether or not we give more weight to the driver's licence signing process, that I think that that should be sufficient. A family might have the right to override, but that if people can simply use their driver's licences, and that is enough to be an organ donor register, that will offer the potential that hundreds of lives could be saved from here. I thank the House for its indulgence on, on this occasion, and I remember my cousin Christopher. Thank you. Thank you. The time allotted for this debate has expired. The debate is adjourned, and the resumption of the debate will be made an order of the day for the next sitting. The clerk. Private member's business notice number two, health services. The member for Herbert. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I move the motion relating to health services in the terms in which it appears on the notice paper. Is the motion seconded? I think that comes later, no, after I finish my speech. No, is that right? I'll let you go on, but it will second it. <laughs> Thank you to the member for Shorten. The member for Shorten has seconded the member for Herbert. Um, Deputy Speaker, um, I don't think there will be any disagreement in the House um, on the view that we support the provision of the highest quality health services uh, to all Australians. Uh, it's really a fundamental part of the beliefs of both sides of the parliament that, uh, in fact, as a uh, as a modern country, uh, we look after our people uh, and we provide them uh, with this support. There is already marvellous support. Uh, our health facilities are, uh, are uh, certainly very good indeed uh, when you compare them to some of the, uh, the other countries in the world. But of course we face the uh, problem of the continuing advances in medical science making available uh, a huge range of other opportunities for the medical profession to do their job even better. But of course that comes with a cost and uh, some of the, uh, the latest drugs and some of the latest technology is hugely expensive. But uh, today I'd like to address the, um, just one small part of all of that technology and that's um, the, uh, the PET CT scanners that are available. And I'd like to address that in the context of making that available universally. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
um, one of the fundamental tenets of Medicare is that uh, there should be universal access uh, across Australia. And access is not only about uh, affordability, uh, it's also about availability. And I understand, as other members of the House understands, that uh, with hugely cost, uh, costly technology, um, you can't have it at the back of Burke. Um, but you've got to be mindful about where you can have it. And currently, um, this modern marvel of PET CT scanning, uh, which is used uh, particularly um, in the detection of cancers and the spread of cancers, uh, currently that's only available in the capital cities. In the whole of the state of Queensland, Mr Deputy Speaker, there's only one uh, PET CT scanner at the Wesley Hospital in Brisbane to service the... Sorry? The, uh, uh, thank you to the member for uh, Shortland being bitter and twisted. We've had an election and now you're in control of the, uh, the government and it's my call that we in fact that we in fact, the member for we in fact uh, will make sure that uh, you address this issue. There's only one, uh, one of these uh, scanners in Queensland, in Brisbane. Uh, and that means that the people, Mr Deputy Speaker, from your electorate have to travel to Brisbane, the people from my electorate. Some of our Queenslanders have to travel um, getting towards 2,000 kilometres uh, to have a PET scan. So um, access should be about uh, availability as well as affordability. Uh, regional Australia does tend to have fewer health services available than our city and urban counterparts, um, and you can understand that. But that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't all be on guard to make sure that where services can be provided, they should be provided. Um, differential access to specialist medical services for rural and remote Queenslanders is in fact demonstrated by uh, this information before the House today. We need a PET scanner in Townsville. We have uh, nuclear medicine facilities which will run PET scanning uh, in the city already. We have qualified doctors who can run it. And it can be provided in both the public and the pri or the private uh, system. Uh, and I'm reminded uh, by the member for Burdekin who wrote a letter this morning to the Townsville Bulletin pointing out that the Townsville Cancer Centre uh, at the Townsville Hospital purchased a new three-dimensional planning system three and a half years ago with PET scanning in mind. But the $300 million that was provided by the Queensland Government post Patel reforms um, uh, for oncology uh, hasn't materialised as far as Townsville is concerned. What, what has happened to the money? Why haven't we seen the Queensland Government invest in such a vital uh, technology uh, for our region? The member for Burdekin makes a very valid point. Queensland's not the only state with this issue, of course. Um, Western Australia and South Australia only have one PET scanner and Tasmania doesn't have one at all. So we need to be thinking uh, as a parliament about the availability of PET CT scanners to regional areas. Uh, in its submission to the uh, Senate Committee on Highway to Health, Better Access for Rural, Regional and Remote Patients, the Cancer Council of Australia pointed to poor outcomes for cancer patients in rural and remote areas. There's growing uh, evidence that cancer mortality rates increase significantly with geographical isolation. Now, that's a very worrying piece of evidence. And for my people in Townsville, um, are, are they uh, in a situation where they don't go to Brisbane to, uh, for the use of this technology and are their mortality rates increasing uh, because of it? Scan uh, PET CT scanning, of course, um, does a job that's different to MRI or just straight CT and it does provide uh, our uh, specialists uh, more information in relation to the spread of cancer and how it can be uh, managed. Uh, Dr Stuart Ramsey at the, um, at the Queensland X-ray certainly is a strong supporter saying that PET CT scanning is long overdue in North Queensland. We've got a, a population uh, uh, um, uh, in the north of uh, uh, perhaps uh, getting close to 700,000 now. Um, there's certainly a need and a demand and uh, a client base for a scanner, 
but we don't uh, have one. So we'll be waiting now um, uh, to see what happens, uh, what the Rudd government does in relation to PET scanning. Um, the minister, Nicola Roxon, has said that she was considering the current situation. Well, we've got to do more than consider. Um, if, uh, if the Howard government was re-elected, I committed to my electorate that we would have a PET scanner in Townsville, and I would have delivered that. I asked the Rudd government to, um, uh, to back my, uh, my commitment and asked the Rudd government to, in fact, make sure that we do get a uh, PET scanner in the city. There is, uh, there is evidence now that you do what the people of North Queensland want, member for Shortland. You get a PET scanner up in Townsville. We are the capital city of Northern Australia. We don't deserve to be second-class citizens. You make sure that our people are looked after, and I'm damn sure I'm going to make sure that uh, we're going to be looked after. And under the standing orders, stop interjecting. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, can Mr. I just say that I will that decide the standing orders? Thank you, um, and you will do it in a very fine way, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. There is evidence now that you can assess people after one dose of chemotherapy uh, using a PET CT scanner to see if that uh, chemo is going to work rather than having to wait for three or four doses. That's beneficial to the patients. It's beneficial to, uh, to the, the professionals who are looking after them. Uh, and surely, 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 in this modern day and age, we can get a PET scanner in Townsville. The PET scanner has applications um, in uh, terms of uh, um, all sorts of cancers. Uh, and, uh, um, we do really need to make sure that we get one uh, in the city. Can I say to you that um, at present, um, many people I'm advised by the professionals in Townsville um, are not travelling, simply not travelling to major cities for uh, PET scans. Um, so if we had a local scanner, uh, then these patients will be more likely to, uh, to come. They'll be more likely to, uh, to see uh, uh, to get their, um, uh, their medical conditions attended to. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, PET scanning was first available uh, on the uh, medical benefits schedule 10 years ago. Uh, it's now in all capital, capital city. It's time that it came uh, to Townsville. Uh, the, um, uh, the Health Minister also needs to look at the kinds of services that are available on PET scanning. Currently, currently they're quite limited and it makes it uneconomic in a place like Townsville to, uh, in fact, install a machine uh, because there's not the customer base to fund the machine to make it uh, economical for the city. So I ask that the, um, uh, that the medical benefits schedule uh, be extended to include uh, all of the conditions that could so well be treated uh, by a uh, PET CT scanner in Townsville. Is the member, sorry, is the motion seconded? Oh, yes, I second it. Thank you. I call then the member for the, the government whip. Thank, yeah, thank, yeah. thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, in seconding the motion, uh, due to the fact that there were no members from the, government, from the opposition side in the House, yeah. um, I second it in terms of the motion and not in terms of a pet, a pet uh, scan. Member for Shortland, resume a seat. The member for Herbert. Mr. So Deputy Speaker, a government, uh, an opposition member wasn't required to second the motion. Uh, in terms of the uh, the procedure, the seconder would, would should have been called on at the end of my speech, and the but member for Shortland should get her facts right. No, the, the, uh, member for Herbert, I call for the member for Shortland to second the the, the opposition. The, the, sorry, the government whip to second it, and thank she has done so. And I call the member for the thank government. Thank you very whip. much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think this uh, motion that's before the House raises some very important issues, and none more important than the, the fact that uh, licences for PET scans under the previous government had been very slow to be granted. It's interesting that the member for Herbert's in here arguing about a PET scan for um, North Queensland, but uh, in the, under the last government, there, was num there were numerous applications put in for the licensing of the PET scan that was already at the Mata Hospital in Newcastle, Mata Hospital being one of the leading hospitals in the treatment of cancer uh, in New South Wales and, for that matter, throughout Australia. Now, 
I wrote numerous I wrote letters to the previous health minister that were never answered. I raised in consideration in details in estimates last year uh, asking the minister if he could give me some information and give consideration to the licensing of the PET scan in the Hunter that my question to the minister was never, never acknowledged or answered, and uh, the Minister for Ageing at the time summed up and uh, didn't choose to uh, deal with that part of the question. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd have to say that the government comes with very dirty uh, the, the opposition comes with di very dirty hands from the time that they were in government uh, during the election campaign the rudd government gave an undertaking that we would fund a pet scan in the hunter that was made on the 7th of September, and it will be no surprise to the House to learn that on the 21st of uh, September, the Me Too member for Paterson then made an undertaking on behalf of the then Howard government that they would do the same. If there was ever an example of Me Tooism, it was exhibited there. Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm pleased to say that the people of the Hunter will have that pet machine licensed at the Mart as something that is very, very vital for that region, for the region that uh, Shortland Electric falls into, and very vital, very vital for the people that are suffering from cancer. Now, I understand that this motion goes a lot further than just looking at uh, PET scans. Rather, it's talking about a commitment to quality health care something that we on this side of the House are totally committed to. It's not something that we've just discovered since the last election. It's something that we've been fighting for for many years. And unfortunately, under the previous government, quality health care was, was something that was just develop, delivered to a few. Now, in the last parliament, I was a member of the Health and Ageing Committee, actually, at the time of the, the report, the blame game being delivered or tabled in Parliament. I was actually deputy chair of that uh, committee, and uh, that committee made a number of very important recommendations. If I can repeat, very important recommendations, and identified a number of problems within the health system in Australia. Now, that report was tabled in November 2006, and believe it or not, by the time Member the last Member parliament— for Shortland, uh, Member for Shortland, for Jim said, Member for Patterson, you have a point of order? Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, the member for Shortland has just uh, um, misrepresented my position. No, no it's not I a point of order. Not a, there are other forms of the House to do that, and the member for Patterson would know that. I call the member for short, the, the government whip. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I understand that the member for Paterson is very, very sensitive about his failure to get the previous government, the previous no. government to fund the pet machine in the Hunter until just before the last election. But, Mr Deputy Speaker, what I am talking about here now is the, the overall delivery of health order. services the member for to, pe in, to people in the Hunter, to in people ejection. in Australia. And the recommendations of the Blaine Gay report, which was a report into health funding and the health system within Australia. Now, this report made a number of very important recommendations. recommendations that the government of the day, the Howard government, failed to respond to. It made a recommendation that this parliament develop and adopt a national health agenda. It also made recommendations that we identify policy and funding principles and initiatives. And it also identified the fact that there was a chronic, a chronic shortage 
of health professionals and doctors in Australia. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, whilst the Howard government refused to respond to this report, the Rudd government will. And in, its, and in its policy that it took to the last election, it gave an undertaking that it would invest $2 billion in a national health and hospital reform plan. Now, this is quite different, quite different to what the Howard government did when they actually ripped money out of hospitals. In this reform funding program, it will include additional funding to state and territory governments if they achieve agreed reform milestones, similar to the system of the competition policy payments designed to reward those states and improve their performance. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a different approach to health. This is an approach that stops the blame game. This is an approach that brings the states, the territories and the Commonwealth together. So is that instead of standing up in this parliament and blaming the states for the problems, or instead of standing up in the state parliament and blaming the Commonwealth for the problems, we actually join together states, Commonwealth, to work for the delivery of quality health services to the people of Australia. Now, I can speak, I can speak with some authority on that, having been previously a member of the state of a state government when there was a, a coalition government in power in Canberra. And at that particular time, I had made a speech where we identified problems at the, at the Commonwealth level. And I have sat here and heard speaker after speaker blame the states for all the problems that exist with health. What happens? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. All that happens is that the member that stands up in whatever parliament makes themselves feel good, puts out a media release, but the people of Australia, the people of Australia who we're representing in this parliament, miss out on the quality health services that they need. We need more doctors. We need to ensure that the people of Australia get the type of health care that they deserve. We don't, need, we don't need any more actions by governments where they, where they use weasel words to get away from the fact that they need to make sure that the money for health goes to delivery of health services rather than to promoting their own health agenda. The question is the motion be agreed to. I call the honourable member for more. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I must first apologise to the member for Herbert. I was not here in time to second the motion. I apologise. Unfortunately, being the doctor here, I was treating someone and I got distracted. They didn't need a PET scan, <laughs> fortunately. <laughs> Thank you. I rise to support the motion. It is essential that the highest quality health services be provided to Australians in a timely fashion. It is critical that the best diagnostic tools be made available to Australians. There is no doubt that accurate diagnosis in the early stages of a disease is vital for effective treatment and management. I want to talk a little bit about this machine we talk about, and so bear with me, I don't want to make it too technical, but I think it's important that members understand what it is. A positron emission tomography or PET scanning, which uh, produces a three-dimensional image of the functional processes of the body is one of the new diagnostic tools we've had, new in the last, only in the last decade or so. The system produces pairs of gamma photons, that's light, emitted indirectly by the positron emitting radioisotope. It is interesting to note that a positron is the antimatter counterpart of an electron, making a PET scanner one of the significant applications of quantum physics. This radioisotope is introduced into the body, usually via the blood circulation on a metabolically active molecule, molecule like a sugar. The common sugar they use in this is called fluorodeoxyglucose, and for the sake of simplicity we'll call it FDG. This then concentrates in the tissues of interest like cancer cells. 
which rapidly take up the glucose because their mitochondria, that's the powerhouses of the cells that make our cells work, need the glucose to be active. And in these cells, of course, there's hyperactivity, overactivity due to their rapid growth, so it concentrates in the tumour cells. The positron emitting isotope is thereby concentrated in these tissues, and the positron is eventually released. And when it encounters an electron, which is in all the cells surrounding it, it annihilates rapidly, producing a pair of photons, bursts of light, which move in opposite directions to one another, allowing for localisation of where this event actually occurred. Thereby, we are able to accurately show where the metastases, that's the spare tumours, is positioned. PET scans are increasingly read alongside computer tomography, or CT scans, the com combination both giving an anatomic and a metabolic informative uh, information on the illness. Limitations to the widespread use of PET scan arise from the high cost of the cyclotrons needed to produce these radioisotopes and also the chemical synthesis apparatus to produce the radiopharmaceuticals necessary for the procedure are quite complex. So again, as the member for Herbert said, to use this in a more wider fashion would sort of make this more cost effective. The pest PET scanner is valuable for oncology because of the cancer's mitochondrial forms. That's the powerhouse forms, right? This is of particular value in Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and lung cancer. It is providing very useful, it's proving very useful cancers like breast and prostate, particularly if the disease recurrence is suspected. Oncology scans using this sugar or the FDG make up 90% of all PET scans in current practice. PET scanning is used in neurology, measuring indirectly blood flow in the brain, and for example, it can be, example, it can be used to differentiate Alzheimer's disease from other forms of dementing processes, and also make an early diagnosis of Alzheimer's with new techniques that can visualise the amyloid parts, which are the essential part of Alzheimer's. PET is also used for localisation of seizure focus and epilepsy, which of course is necessary if we're going to apply surgery to treat epilepsy, which is a more common means of treating epilepsy. It is proving of increasing value in cardiology, neurophysiology, psychiatry and pharmacology. So I can tell the House we will hear much more about this potentially magnificent tool for medicine in the future. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Solomon. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and congratulations on your appointment also. Um, today I'd, I would like to use my contribution to set out, our, set out the Rudd government's plan f for improved health services for my electorate of Solomon, and I can certainly uh, concur with the uh, member for uh, Herbert with uh, regards to the isolation at times with our health, health services. I was pleased last September when I met with the Shadow Minister to discuss the Rudd's government commitment for a GP super clinic in Palmerston. The Rudd government's commitment will see a contribution of up to $10 million towards the creation of a GP super clinic to provide better health services to top-end families. I have already met with the Minister's office and indicated that I see the delivery of this commitment as fundamental, a fundamental priority for the working families of Solomon. The minister has informed me that consultation will commence in April with the local community and local health professionals. I would also like to thank the Northern Territory Department of Health and Community Services for the preliminary work they, are, they have been undertaking on this important project. Once completed, the Palmerston GP Super Clinic is expected to include a 24-hour GP service, chronic disease and complex care management services, outpatient services provided on an outreach basis for the Royal Darwin Hospital such as cancer and oncology uh, uh, support services, obstetricians, um, gynaecology and uh, ophthalmology. A greater range of allied health services such as physiotherapy, dietitians and podiatry um, are also uh, will be available, along with dental services. Speaking of dental services, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, I'm pleased with two important commitments uh, that the Rudd government has made uh, to the community in this vital area. I was quite shocked to learn um, after my election that there's nearly 3,957 3, Territorians uh, that are on dental waiting lists. Two important commitments were outlined by the, government, uh, by the Rudd government. 
will see the establishment of the Commonwealth Dental Health Scheme, which will provide $290 million for up to, 100, uh, for up to 1 million additional treatments. And secondly, the government will also introduce a teen dental plan that will provide um, up to $150 uh, of a tax rebate to help families um, to help families in receipt of the family tax benefit A. These are both practical solutions to help families in the area of dental care. People's teeth are so important uh, to their overall self-confidence, and I think that the investment uh, is great news for families. Federal Labor is committed to ending the blame game. I know that a lot of that happens um, in regards to health um, between the states and the ter territories um, and to improve, improve health care for all Australians. Um, I'm looking forward to working with the Minister uh, to deliver this um, in Labor's plan for a $1.5 billion national health reform plan to improve health and hospital services around the country. And like all electorates, uh, Solomon's no different. And, uh, you know, I think the basics, the basics of just having health care for all Australians um, is, is vital um, and it's singularly you know, probably one of the biggest issues that I found getting around my electorate um, and talking to people uh, was the lack of uh, health services, especially in the Palmerston area. It's a growing area and certainly uh, usually kids will get crook um, at the most inopportune times. Um, and at 2 a.m. in the morning, having to drive in from Palmerston to the uh, Darwin Hospital um, is, is an issue for people. So I look forward to working with the minister, and I thank her uh, for those, um, you know, the way that she's been keeping me informed as to the progress, and I look forward to delivering this for the people of Solomon. Thank you. The question is the motion be agreed to. Call the honourable member for Boothby. Um, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and congratulations on uh, your election to um, to, to this position. I'm very pleased to speak on the motion um, which has been moved by the member for Herbert. And, uh, the first um, limb uh, of the motion um, supports the provision of the highest quality health services to Australians. And they are, uh, that is an aspiration that all members of this House um, would, uh, would hold. Um, Australia does enjoy one of the best uh, health systems in the world. By any measure, you can look at life expectancy. We have one of the longest life expectancies um, in the world. We are comparable with Sweden and Switzerland and ahead of comparable countries like the United States, the United Kingdom and, uh, and, and New Zealand. Our survival rates for, for many cancers, again, are comparable with, uh, with world best practice. We have um, specialised uh, centres for treat treatment of things like colorectal cancer, um, breast cancer, our survival rates are extremely, uh, extremely high there. Um, we enjoy um, low uh, child mortality, low infant mortality, low maternal mortality, again, um, good indicators of a very strong health system. But as the member for Herbert has correctly pointed out, our health is unequal. And, uh, and this was highlighted uh, last week, of course, that we do um, have uh, on a whole range of measures for Indigenous health um, that they have a much lower um, health outcomes than the rest of the population. But also the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare in a recent report in two, 2005 um, made the well-known point that people who live away from major cities and for whom access to health services is restricted may be disadvantaged as a result of different access to specialist surgery and medical care services. And uh, this is something that's long been noted by organisations such as the Australian Medical Association and uh, the National Rural Health Alliance. And uh, when we look, for example, and I should make the point that uh, the, the PET technology is not, it's not applicable um, to everywhere, but Queensland in particular is the most decentralised state. And uh, you have major population centres um, all up the coast in, in, in Queensland. And uh, there, are, there are very good arguments that can be made for extension of the PET technology. As uh, previous members um, have said, uh, most notably um, the member for Moore, um, that uh, there are a whole range of applications um, for this technology. It's useful in diagnosis, it's valuable in treatment, it can be used to monitor the effect of surgery, uh, radiation therapy and chemotherapy. 
Um, so it's only going to be applicable in a, in a larger centre. But also, um, MSAC, the Medical Services Advisory Committee, are looking at um, its application in a whole range of new areas, stage by stage. They're looking um, at whether it can be extended to ovarian melanoma and colorectal cancer. The second stage is esophageal, gastric and head and neck cancer. Third stage, lymphoma. Fourth stage, sarcoma and glioma. And we do have evidence-based medicine. We do have the Medical um, Services Advisory Committee. And I do uh, believe we do need to maintain um, the rigor of, of those bodies. But having said that, there's been quite a debate in the Medical Journal of Australia, most notably in 2004, um, that Australia does not have enough uh, positron emission tomography machines, that we do need uh, a much larger number. We only currently, uh, there's only currently um, eight eligible uh, centres um, in Australia. Um, as uh, the member for Lyons said, uh, there's not one in Tasmania, but I understand that the, uh, the Labor Party has committed um, to uh, introducing, introducing uh, one in Hobart. So I, I welcome the opportunity to, um, to, to speak on this, uh, on this motion. Um, the, uh, the PET technology is a useful technology um, and uh, if, uh, if supported by the evidence it should be more widely available and should be uh, available for a much uh, greater number of indications. Thank you. The question is the motion be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Braddon. Mr Deputy Speaker, um, there's no doubt about it that health is an issue that dominates our kitchen table discussions, and none more so than in my electorate of Braddon. Um, we're all aware of the growing demands on the provision of health services, and that's obviously for a variety of reasons, but um, there's growing demand and pressure on, for example, service delivery across the board. Um, attracting, training and maintaining a sufficient workforce in particular, and uh, none more so than in rural and regional Australia, uh, and of course the increasing equipment, material and capital costs associated with the provision of health services. Um, indeed, in relation to the latter, the provision of uh, MRI equipment and uh, PET scanners in particular are special examples of this, and uh, other speakers have highlighted this. Um, I was pleased that Federal Labor, in its health and wellbeing policies for Tasmania in general and uh, on the northwest coast in particular, uh, saw Labor honouring the MRI licensing commitment of the former government for the northwest coast, and uh, we're very pleased to do that. And we'll see the setting up of a $3.5 million PET scanner in Hobart to service the state. So very valuable, very necessary uh, services. Uh, in addition, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, Federal Labor offered Tasmania above and beyond the normal health agreement funding a $50 million health and wellbeing package. And, um, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, put on the record uh, some of those health initiatives, particularly for the North West Coast. Most importantly, and we share this with the rest of Australia, is Labor's commitment to uh, reduce uh, elective surgery waiting lists. And I was very pleased with the additional $8 million that was given to Tasmania for an additional 895 procedures uh, to try and tackle these long waiting lists. And uh, that's something we don't need to be blaming each other for or about. We just need to do something about it. Um, I was very pleased with the Commonwealth's uh, reinvigoration of the dental health scheme, and particularly in my electorate of Braddon, which has unfortunately one of the highest uh, waiting lists for dental, uh, for dental um, services, um, and also our commitment to trying to get more nurses back into the hospital system, particularly the $81 million commitment to do this. But more specifically on the North West Coast, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was very pleased to be part of a, a collective of people uh, that lobbied uh, federal labour to provide some of the following services. For example, $7.7 million commitment to a new tra cancer treatment unit, preferably on the North well, West Coast. The member Coast. for Braddon will resume his seat. The member for Herbert? Do you have a point of order? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, I do, uh, draw your attention to the state of the House, please. Uh, uh, the, uh, you require a quorum?
form required? And you make a judgment. Yeah. You'll make a judgment. You make a judgment. Yeah. Uh, the, the member for Herbert, the member for Braddon, the member for Braddon, and the member for Herbert. In accordance with Standing Order 55C, the House will be counted at the conclusion of the grievance debate, if that time the member so desires. I call the member for Braddon in continuation. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I want to use this time for what it was meant for, and that is to be able to raise issues that affect my electorate and this country. And if you want to make a joke of it, mate, leave. Do us all a favour and get out of the system. Uh, $7.7 million, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, for a new cancer treatment unit, preferably on the northwest coast. Uh, we've got wonderful commitments of $5 million or up to $5 million for a GP super clinic in Devonport and $2.5 million for a, uh, an after-hours doctor's clinic uh, in Burnie. Uh, very importantly, um, the um, $60,000 uh, con contribution to a new Penguin Medical Centre. And of course, that will help, particularly in its relationship to uh, uh, the uh, nursing homes that are nearby. Um, I'd also like to point out, of course, that the Mersey Hospital was part and parcel of this election, very much so. Well, Labor, I'm proud to say, has made the decision to honour that commitment. We're working a way to do that, and Order. I give our assurance Order. we want to make those health services. Expired. The or, or, member for Braddon's time has expired. Uh, I call the member for the, the question is the motion to be agreed to. The debate then is adjourned for the resumption of the debate and will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. I call the clerk. Government business, uh, sorry, private members' business. Uh, notice number three. Motion relating to interest rates. I call the member for um, Lindsay. I move the motion relating to interest rates in the terms in which it appears in the notice paper. Okay. The, member for, the member for Lindsay. Mr Deputy Speaker, I rise to give some public recognition in this House of the pain and the suffering that many working families throughout this country are now feeling uh, as a result of recent increases in interest rates. As members of the House would be aware, at the February meeting uh, earlier this month, at its February meeting, the Reserve Bank took the decision to increase the official cash rate by 0.25 of a per cent, uh, which took the cash rate to 7 per cent. This, of course, represents the 11th consecutive increase in interest rates. Most disturbing about uh, this particular decision, uh, and in particular the comments of the Reserve Bank as described in the minutes that they have released uh, that record the events of that meeting, and I must take this opportunity to uh, acknowledge that this is the first time that the minutes of the Reserve Bank's meeting have been published in this way, which I think is a significant move towards making those decisions which impact on so many individuals and families throughout our community much more transparent. In those minutes, uh, most, of most concern to the working families of my electorate would be the comment that is taken from the minutes that reads, the debate focused on whether the change in the cash rate should be 25 or 50 basis points. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, apart from the increase that we've recently seen of those 25 basis points, what we now have knowledge of is that the Reserve Bank were actively considering increasing the official cash rate by 50 basis points. Now, <coughs> I might begin by saying I'm glad that they did not do that, uh, but I think there is also a very stern warning, a stern warning to us all, and particularly to many of the, the families in my electorate, of what that may uh, indicate in terms of what the future position of the bank may be. The, the key issue that is driving uh, the continued increase in interest rates is inflation. There's no question about that. If you look at both the minutes and the RBA's statement on monetary policy, it is clear 
that inflation, underlying inflation, is now running well and truly outside of the uh, Reserve Bank's preferred band of between 2 and 3 per cent. In fact, uh, it is now running at a rate of about 3.6 per cent. This, this, in underlying terms, this reflects the high inflation legacy that has been left by the former Howard government. I wish to, uh, to, to just reflect upon some of the detail of how these interest rate increases have been affecting people in my electorate, in the electorate of Lindsay. And I wish to, to make the specific point that whilst mortgage holders right around this country have been impacted by these incre increases in interest rates, in particular places such as Western Sydney and my electorate, the electorate of Lindsay, have been more adversely affected by those increases than many others. And this is a fact that the Reserve Bank itself acknowledged back in its financial stability review in, Mar in March of 2007. On that occasion, the bank reflected on uh, the fact that whilst uh, the overall picture for the nation was looking good, the bank went on to say, areas of Western Sydney in particular look to have been adversely affected by the fall in residential property prices with a disproportionate number of households in this area taking out loans with high loan to valuation and debt servicing ratios near the peak of the house price boom. Partly reflecting this, the arrears rate and the number of personal administrations has increased by more in New South Wales than in other states. Now that was true when the Reserve Bank issued that statement back in March 2007, and it remains the case. Mr Deputy Speaker, the other point of considerable concern emerging from the minutes of the bank's last meeting uh, go to the, the following quote, where the bank said, the risk of inflation remaining uncomfortably high for some time is considerable. Absent a further shift in the economic risks to the downside, therefore, monetary policy is likely to need to be tighter in the period ahead. Now, the impact of this for working families in my electorate has been, uh, has been extreme. Throughout the course of the election campaign between July, uh, shortly after I first became pre-selected as a candidate, right through to the election itself, I door knocked some 23,000 households in my electorate. And I have to tell you, Mr Deputy Speaker, that there were a number of issues of concern to people and principally uh, their concerns about work choices. Uh, were expressed to me in the course of, of those discussions that ensued. But one of the other significant issues was the impact of interest rates, and in, in particular the impact of interest rates against the background of the increasing cost of living. In an outer suburban electorate such as Lindsay, many working families rely upon several motor vehicles in order to go about their business each day. So the high, co high cost of petrol has had a particularly severe impact on the household budget. In addition to that, with a fairly low uh, median age in terms of uh, what our population is, we have a, a number of young families that have uh, their children in childcare, and the increases that we have seen in the cost of childcare have been dramatic and well and truly above uh, the overall rate of inflation across the rest of the economy. And of course, members of this place are well aware of the increase that we've experienced in the price of groceries over that period as well. So all of this builds to form a picture of many families that are under mortgage stress and also rental stress. And I just acknowledge the fact that in 2006, 33.5 per cent of the households in my electorate of Lindsay were suffering mortgage stress. Now that is an increase from 19.5 per cent back in 2001, which accounts for a 111.8 per cent increase. That gives you some indication of the extent to which the, the pressures on working families in my electorate have increased considerably over that period. Now this of course was a, a fact that seemed to be lost on those members of the other side, the former government. The former member for Bennelong, and I acknowledge the presence of the current member for Bennelong in the chamber, mm -hmm. the former member for Bennelong, uh, as we will all recall, said that working families in Australia had never been better off. Now, this was one of those sentiments that 
I was not able to find one supporter of throughout my electorate in the course of my campaign uh, between when I was pre-selected and November 2007. So it's further evidence of how out of touch the former member for Bennelong was, the former Prime Minister, but it was also symptomatic of the views more broadly throughout the, the then government. Can I say that uh, this is just further evidence of the high inflation legacy that's been left behind? Uh, but that legacy is a legacy built on two pillars. It's built on the first pillar, which is one of complacency, and the second pillar is, a, is denial. Uh, in the first instance, we see that uh, the complacency is best given expression in the words of the member for, I for Higgins, the former Treasurer, who said as far back as the 28th of July 1999 that there is no life left in the inflation dragon. Well, it seemed to have puffed a few more breaths and has now become a fighting force that this nation now needs to contend with. And more recently, as recently as the 26th of July 2007, uh, the member for Higgins said, we have inflation now right where we want it. Well, I'm not exactly where, sure where that is, but it's certainly not between the Reserve Bank's preferred band of 2 to 3 per cent. Can I say that on the issue of denial, the denial upon which this government's inflation legacy is built continues in the words of the member for Wentworth, who said that Wayne Swan is trying to create a myth, a fairy tale about economic history. And then, uh, if I can read from a report in the Financial Review on the 9th of February this year, Asked if inflation was out of the target band, Mr Turnbull on Friday said it was not. Well, so much for fairy tales. The story that I tell today is not of a fairy tale. It is the nightmare that residents of, of my electorate, working families in my electorate, are living with. Can I say, let's not look to the words of the member for Wentworth. Uh, let's not look to the words of the... Uh, member for Higgins, let's look to the words of a respected economist, Mr Barry Hughes, reported in The Australian a few days ago. He said, they, referring to the Rudd Labor government, have been dealt a much tougher hand than either John Howard or Bob Hawke got in 1983. Mm. Mr Speaker, we have a plan, a five-point plan, to tackle inflation. We also have a plan to make switching banks more of an option for... Order. The honourable member's time has expired. Uh, I call for a second for the motion. Is there a motion seconded? Motion and reserve my right to speak. Thank you. I, the question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the honourable member for Stirling. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, and if I just uh, might begin today by saying that um, uh, the member for Moncrief was very keen uh, to make a contribution to this debate today. Um, but of course he's uh, unable to because his status in this place remains unresolved. Uh, and I think that's a very sad day because what we have seen, uh, astonishingly, is the Speaker arbitrarily, arbitrarily decide uh, on whether a member needs to leave this chamber or not. And I wonder whether that's precedented in the history of Federation, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, well, the, the, member, the members opposite uh, are interjecting, and I'd, be very, uh, I'd be very happy for them to be able to make a contribution uh, on that, whether well, the Speaker has— Sterling, resume. The, uh Member for Lyme. The chair, uh, Mr. Speaker. You have a I don't, uh, order, my point order. of order is, is whether you have this, a point of this, order. this I, member I, is speaking to the motion before the chair. So I couldn't hear your point of order. What? Uh, 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 Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <coughs> You've got the call. Thank you. Uh, I'm asking, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, whether. Uh, what uh, is this uh, member addressing? What motion is before the chair, and whether this member is addressing the motion that's before the chair? Thank the member for line. I call the member for Stirling and remind him of the motion before the chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And uh, at your command, I'll move on directly to the motion. Um, and can I say uh, to the member for Lindsay, I congratulate him on his election to this place. Um, but it must be terribly disappointing for him, uh, and I think also for his constituents, that he's brought a private member's business before this chamber. Um, yet uh, his colleagues, uh, the Treasurer, uh, the Finance Minister, uh, the Assistant the, Treasurer— The member for Sterling of Jeremy seat, the uh, Chief Government Whip. Well, Government Whip. Well, the Government Whip, my apologies, <laughs> have been yes. elevated. 
Ah, uh, that's all right. Well, uh, yes, Mr. Deputy Speaker. You have a point of order. Uh, I ha very definitely have a point of that order. Is... My point of order is that the that the speaker is actually flaunting your ruling. He's no, not coming to the. No, there's no the, point of order. No I'm, relevance. There's it's no not point of order. Call the honourable member for Stirling, and I'm listening to him. And he has only been resumed the speaking for the last 15 seconds. I'll call the member for Stirling. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, if I, so I was saying that uh, it is very disappointing for the new member for Lindsay um, to bring this motion before the House as private member's business, uh, and his colleagues haven't even given him the courtesy or his constituents the courtesy the, of listening the, to what he has to the say. Mem the member Sterling, if you me, the member, f the, the government whip on. Relevance once again, no, no, Mr. Deputy no. Speaker. He is not speaking to no, the motion. The, the government whip will resume her seat. I call it, and there is not a point of order. And I'll deal with it if she continues to disrupt on frivolous points of order. I call the member for Stirling. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the government has a fundamentally uh, inconsistent approach to managing of the economy. On the one hand, um, you see uh, members coming into this chamber uh, and talking down the strength uh, of the Australian economy. Uh, and what they are fundamentally trying to deny uh, is the fact that the Rudd Labor government uh, has inherited the strongest. As an incoming government, they have inherited the strongest economic position uh, of any government in the history of this country. Um, and what they have is a strategy uh, to talk down the Australian economy. Now, in a fast-growing economy, and I'm sure the member for uh, Maribyrnong would be aware of this, in a fast-growing uh, economy, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, in a very tight labour market, uh, you have challenges that are associated with managing that economy. Um, and when you're approaching that challenge, can I say that the last thing the government wants to do is run around um, like Chicken Little, saying how terrible the problem is and talking up the problem. Uh, and this is what we have had uh, from the Prime Minister, from the Treasurer, from the Finance Minister. Uh, extraordinarily, we've also had it from the Foreign Minister when he was making a speech to uh, potential investors in Australia in New York. Um, and I've got this uh, article from the ABC website, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Michael Blythe, uh, the chief economist uh, for the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, um, he has uh, given evidence um, um, to the Committee for Economic Development. Uh, he contributed to a forum they had the other day, uh, and he said, and I think this is uh, very important that the House note this. He says maybe we're being a bit too pessimistic on the inflation story for Australia, uh, and then he goes on to say uh, it's it's very important not to talk down the economy. Um, now, I think this is a very important point. Yes, we have a fast-growing economy. Yes, we have a very tight labour market. And yes, that presents challenges. Uh, and that's what the government's been elected to address, is challenges. Um, now, and, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, when they're addressing this challenge, uh, it's vitally important that they don't make it worse, which, of course, is what they're doing at the moment. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd just like to place some facts on the record, because we do have a lot of disinformation uh, on, this on the state of the Australian economy at the moment. Um, and the member for Lindsay was talking about inflation in the recent December quarter. Um, now, one way to assess the strength of the Australian economy uh, is to compare us with, uh, um, with, with our competitors, uh, particularly the OECD countries. Uh, and inflation in the December quarter, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, Australia uh, was, of course, at the lower end for its trading partners for inflation within the December quarter. Uh, and By the way, uh, contrary to what the member for Lindsay was saying, uh, inflation does remain within the target rate that was established by the RBA, which is 2 to 3 per cent. Um, the reality, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, is that compared to our trading partners, inflation in Australia is particularly low. Um, if, if we look at the weighted average within the OECD, um, the, the OECD weighted average is 3.3 per cent. Uh, and importantly, it's very low, but it's also particularly, uh, but it's very low. And we need to remember that Australia is growing faster than, the, than most of the other countries within the OECD. So if we look at the record, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, Australia is growing faster than our competitors, yet inflation remains lower. Um, the other very important point to make is, of course, that unemployment, unemployment remains vastly lower than our, than our economic competitors. So we have a situation where our inflation rate is lower, our uh, unemployment rate is lower, and our growth rates are higher. Uh, and the reality is the, government, the incoming government has inherited a stronger economy than any incoming government in the history of Australia. 
Uh, and uh, what they shouldn't do, Mr Deputy Speaker, is perpetuate this myth that they haven't inherited uh, the most amazing uh, economic state and an economy that was called the wonder down under by The Economist magazine. Uh, and they should uh, acknowledge uh, this and not run around the country talking down the economy. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to move very quickly to uh, the five-point plan that's been put forward uh, by the Prime Minister. Um, and what we all, you've always got to actually look at what this government does and not at what they say. Because um, what you'll find is that uh, you know, the Prime Minister is very uh, the, the Prime Minister will often just make a speech and you know, he really has a habit of just stating the obvious and then trying to put forward this as, a, as something that's uh, incredibly profound. I mean he came along to Perth on the 21st of January, uh, and this is the speech where he announced his five-point plan to fight inflation. Uh, and he starts his speech by saying, uh, "The future of the national economy is core business for the new government of Australia." Um, I would have thought that's really a statement of the obvious. Uh, when he goes on to list his, uh, list his uh, five-point plan, again, what we see is just a collection of clichés. It's just a collection of statements of the obvious. Um, what he said is that the government will be committed to fiscal restraint. Um, well, that's not bad because this government has inherited. A, uh, this government has inherited a zero net debt position, as opposed to when the Howard government came in and we inherited $96 billion of Labor debt. Um, that's real fiscal restraint, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, paying off Australia's debt. Uh, he went on to say private demand and saving for the future. Well, very admirable. Again, there's no detail about how he intends to actually encourage private savings. Uh, point three, tackling chronic skill shortages. Um, I think this is an important point, Mr Deputy Speaker, and it seems to be um, one of the government's main attack points uh, on the opposition at the moment. Um, but what we have in Australia is we have an a, a, uh, incredibly low rate of unemployment, uh, and that obviously puts pressures uh, on employers who, are finding, uh, who wish to find uh, skilled employees. Uh, point number four for the five-point plan to fight inflation, uh, national leadership to tackle infrastructure bottlenecks. Uh, and, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, again, that's a very noble sentiment, but there's no level of detail. Um, the infrastructure minister um, seems to think he's going to get his hands on all this superannuation money to do it, um, but again, he never talks. He never actually explains the mechanism through which he might do that. So, in, in, in the few seconds uh, I've got remaining, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, can I say that uh, the Rudd Labor government has the best, has inherited the best economic position of any preceding government before it. And instead of running around like chicken littles, talking down the Australian economy and destroying business confidence, what they should do uh, is uh, be managing the challenges of the economy as the previous government did. The member for Lyons. Mr Deputy Speaker, and with your protection, uh, I will continue. <laughs> the member for um, <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a government that, is, that, that has inherited a fast-growing economy. Uh, they have inherited. Uh, extremely low unemployment, and instead of complaining about doing Order. their jobs, they Order. should get on with doing it. The member's time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Blacksland. Well, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and can I congratulate the member for Lindsay for bringing this motion before the House, one of the most important motions we could debate in this chamber, because inflation, interest rates and the threat that they pose to working families is the greatest challenge that confronts this government at this time. And I have to say it's with a deep amount of concern that I hear from the member for Stirling that he still thinks Australians have never been better off. The fact is, inflation is the great menace. Well, I can hear these cries coming from the other side of the chamber, but Mr. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm more concerned about the cries of working families. Cries of working families in places like Western Sydney and cries from working families in my electorate. Inflation is the great menace that confronts us. It erodes savings and productivity, destroys businesses and communities, and hurts working families. Now, last year, the member for North Sydney said this on the record about inflation. It's the curse, the great evil that cuts to the core. Inflation is the cancer on the economy. Well, I agree. I think that's right. The problem is they did nothing about it. They allowed it to gather momentum. It just didn't pop up on the 25th of November last year. This is something that's been brewing, causing problems and hurting working families for the last two years or more. The problem is all of the warnings, the 20 warnings from the Reserve Bank, 
all ignored. Now, the, the member for Higgins giving his due, he's often accused by others of laying back in his hammock doing nothing about inflation. But we learn by reading the Howard biography that he was there trying his best, doing his hardest, trying to rein in that spending spree from the former Prime Minister. But he did it in vain. He failed, and the working families of Australia are paying the consequence of that failure. Inflation is now at 3.6 per cent. That's the highest level in 16 years, with the threat that it will go even higher. <clears throat> we learnt this week from the Assistant Governor of the Reserve Bank, Malcolm Eady, when he told a CEDA conference that it could reach closer to 4 per cent next month. Now, that's what we inherited, Mr Deputy Speaker, the highest inflation in 16 years, the second highest in the developed world, with the threat of it going even higher if we don't act. Now, I'm not saying it's the highest inflation in the world, not by a long shot. We, it was reported yesterday that Zimbabwe's inflation has gone to, uh, I think it's 100,000 per cent. But I don't think anyone here is about to say that that's a precedent or that's a template that we should aspire to replicate. It's not the type of good government and responsible economic management that Australia benchmarks itself on. The shadow treasurer told us only very recently that the inflation problem is a fairy tale. The member for Lindsay made it very clear today when he said it's not a fairy tale, it's a nightmare. And it's a nightmare for people around the country more particularly Western Sydney and very particularly in my electorate of Blacksland. They're paying the price because the former government failed to act. I mentioned very briefly in my first speech to this House earlier this week what the impact of that is. 300 families lost their homes this year in Blacksland because they couldn't keep up with the, the rising cost of interest rates and the pressure that put on them. Their houses, for example, have also dropped by 16 per cent over the course of the last three years. They lost their homes because the former government lost their way and, as a consequence, they lost their job. Well, what lies ahead? The Reserve Bank has advised that interest rates are expected to be at or above the target band for the next two years. And if we don't heed this warning, it's not going to be a problem for the next two years. It will be a problem for the next generation. Monetary policy is a very blunt instrument. It ends up hurting about a third of the people in this country, the people with mortgages. And we have a responsibility as a good government to do more than just use monetary policy to help the Reserve Bank. What we've got here is a stark contrast. You've got two types of people in this chamber. You've got the Rudds and the Duds. The Rudds have got a plan for the future. The Duds have lost their way. You've got the Rudds who've got a plan to tackle inflation and you've got the duds who only had one plan to tackle inflation, and that was work choices. They said work choices that help keep inflation under control. Now they say it's dead. The, earlier this week they said it was alive again. Now it's dead again. It's the zombie policy, Mr Deputy Speaker, that they're going to bring back to life at the next election. Well, the nightmare of work choices will soon be over for the people of Australia, but the nightmare of inflation let loose let out of control by the former government is going to hurt the people of this country and going to hurt the people of my electorate for a lot longer to come unless we do the work needed Order. to put it in its place. The member's time has expired. The member for Cowper. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I'm pleased to take this opportunity to speak on this motion before the House. But before I begin the central elements of my contribution, I'd just like to refer to a number of statements made by the previous speaker, and he did refer to benchmarking and somehow was attempting to compare the Australian economy to uh, Zimbabwe, I think it was. And, uh, but it's interesting to note that if I was to refer to the words for the member for Fraser some years ago in the early 90s, and, he, and I, can't, I can't remember his words exactly, but he was actually comparing this economy, comparing this economy to Mali, Peru and Bangladesh. And it, and we don't compare ourselves with Mali, Peru and Bangladesh anymore, but I might say that they were the comparisons being drawn under the previous Labor government. Mali, Peru and Bangladesh. And I also refer to the issue raised in relation to high mortgages. But he didn't mention the huge state imposts that are put upon home buyers in Western Sydney, the huge costs that are imposed by the New South Wales and other state governments. He was silent on this point. 
He was very silent on this point, and I see him leaving the chamber. He's lost interest because he doesn't want to hear the truth. He doesn't want to hear the fact that state Labor is driving up. He's, he's turned around. He's turned tail yet again. He didn't want to hear the fact that state Labor is driving up the cost of housing. But let me continue with my contribution, Mr Deputy Speaker, because uh, there is very much an issue of confidence out there in the Australian economy. And confidence is an important element in any market. It is the very foundation for strong economics within those markets. It's the very foundation of a, an orderly market as opposed to an, a market that's out of control. And what we see appearing in the Australian market is a crisis, the Australian economy for that matter, is a crisis of confidence in the Treasurer. The people do not believe the Treasurer has what it takes to run a $1.1 trillion economy. A treasurer who comes into this House and seems to be in a hell of a muddle over what Nauru is. He seems to think it's the Pacific solution. And he, seemed, he seemed to think it was the Pacific solution. And Mr, Mr. Speaker, he, uh, he referred to a, a whole range of things and said, well, sometimes I have the answers and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'll be able to give this House the answers and sometimes I don't. The Treasurer of this economy, the Treasurer of this economy, responsible, responsible for a $1.1 trillion economy, uncertain of the concept of Nauru and certainly out of his depth. He certainly moved from brown paper bagonomics to trying to run a $1.1 trillion economy and he's come up short. He's come up short, Mr Speaker. And uh, the people of Australia are seeing that. They are nervous. Confidence is faltering. Confidence is falling. People need to have the confidence to invest. They need to have the confidence to purchase. But under this treasurer, under this treasurer, we see a fall in confidence. They believe that people, that he doesn't have the confidence to run the economy. And I was reading in a paper today, the Herald Sun, and this publication and an article by Steve Lewis. And what what was said of the treasurer in that? said voters rated Swan as, and I quote, dishonest and slimy and an untrustworthy character. That's from in the paper today. Dishonest and slimy and an untrustworthy character. Now that has to have an effect on confidence, Mr Deputy Speaker. That has to have an effect on confidence. But there's a great there's a great irony with the Australian Labor Party. They have opposed every measure that the previous government took to bring the budget into surplus. They opposed every measure to implement solid economic policy. They oppose tax reform, and yet at the end of the day they claim to be fiscal conservatives. They claim to be fiscal conservatives. They oppose, they oppose every measure that was put in place, Mr Deputy Speaker. So it's, it's, I find it very ironic. I find it very ironic that, that the members opposite can come into this House and claim the mantle of fiscal conservatism when during, during, their time, during their time on the opposition benches they did not assist the government of the day with the passage of those bills. They voted against them. They voted against them. And you, you are all, on, all of the previous members, you're on the record. You're on the record voting against the GST. We all remember the, the day of fundamental injustice. The day of fundamental injustice uh, from, the, from the now Prime Minister. Order. The member's time has now expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I'll call the member for Morton. Uh, Acting Speaker, I rise in support of the motion before the House put so eloquently by the member for Lindsay. Yeah. Acting Speaker, inflation is impacting working families around the nation as tight household budgets struggle to find extra money to meet daily cost of living pressures. Petrol, groceries, housing prices. The basic costs of living have been spiralling out of reach of many families for way too long. In light of this, I welcome the leadership of the Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Competition, Policy and Consumer Affairs to establish the National Grocery Prices Inquiry. The uh, ACCC inquiry will now make sure we are getting a fairer deal at the supermarket. The inquiry will investigate all aspects of the supply chain, from the farm gate to the checkout, to see what more can be done to ensure working families have access to a fair, competitive food market. Of course, there are many causes for Australia's current inflationary pressures. The US subprime mortgage crisis and spiralling world oil prices are certainly playing a part. However, at home we face our own challenges. 
A nationwide skills crisis across many industries is driving up wages and inflation, and this pressure in the labour market is simply not sustainable. Now, the freeze on uh, MP wages sends a strong signal to the private sector that we are serious about controlling wage growth. Uh, and yesterday, this was acknowledged in, in the chamber by the, um, the member for whose name I've forgotten. Sorry, the member for Slipper. Sorry. Uh, the member for the member. Better Slipper Fisher. The member for Fisher. I beg your pardon, uh, Mr. Slipper. <laughs> The neglect of skills and maniacal pursuit of union-busting projects like the Australian Technical Colleges, especially when the real opportunities were waiting in our TAFE colleges and universities, <laughs> shows how the former government dropped the ball when it came to skills. But perhaps the biggest factor in Australia's current inflationary explosion is the legacy of the previous government. Today's inflationary pressures are a direct result of the Howard Costello's government's failure to act on a number of Reserve Bank inflation warnings. How many warnings? 20. Not one, not two, not three, not, not ten, not fifteen, but twenty. Twenty, 20. warnings. 20. twenty warnings. The previous government was blind to the needs of working families, and the Howard Costello government just refused to act. Six official interest rate rises in the last term of government, and they refused to act. Deputy Speaker, Australians are entitled to feel ripped off. The coalition spent 11 and a half years masquerading as the masters of economic management, but we now know that to be a complete fraud. While enjoying the spoils of the hawk keating economic reforms, the hawk keating realistic economic reforms, tough reforms, the Howard government failed to address the skills crisis, failed to act in infrastructure for the future and failed to take any meaningful measures to ensure housing affordability. What are their economic reforms? What was their number one economic reform? As mentioned by my previous colleagues, only one, and that was work choices. And now the members opposite treat work choices like a policy that it was something they stepped in. They, they want to <laughs> get as far away from it as possible. The previous government cared so little about housing affordability that they didn't even have a housing minister and contributed very modestly to public housing. Instead, they just filled the, the, the pockets of private landlords through rent assistance. Shameful. The Reserve Bank cash rate now stands at 7 per cent. Of course, this means many families are now paying more than 9 per cent on their mortgages. Now, that 9 per cent, that 9 per cent, I'm not talking about the Leader of the Opposition's approval rating, I'm talking about 9 per cent for mortgages. In my electorate, mortgage belts like Maruka, Salisbury and Eight Mile Plains are really doing it tough. Every rate rise is a kick in the guts for families already struggling to make end, ends meet. Now, I read in the Sydney Morning Herald today that some families are going without meals and basic, basic health care just to cover skyrocketing rents. That's shameful. The, uh, John Howard and Peter Costello, uh, their echo, sorry, I said Peter Costello, I should have said uh, the part-time member for Higgins, I beg your pardon. The economic legacy must be contrasted with his statements. Where is the member for Higgins, actually? Where, where is anyone from the other side? Uh, so, To contrast that with the Prime, previous Prime Minister's statement that Australian families have never been better off. Acting Speaker, finally we have a government, federal government that cares about working families and is prepared to do the hard yards to fight inflation. One of the, our first strategies was to turn the tide of reckless government spending. Uh, the member for Higgins wanted to keep wearing the Corey's big yellow sunglasses and keep Order. the party going. The Rudd Labor Order. government is the much motion, more reasonable. The member's time has expired. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question is, the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Macmillan. Deputy Speaker, I'm going to enjoy my time in the Parliament uh, watching as new members come forth with overblown rhetoric, although I did enjoy the member for Blackslands comment on there's the Rudds and the Duds, so there's going to be some real inspiration come from these new members. Disappointed with the member for Lyons, though, Mr Deputy Speaker, a, a, a person of such talent and experience attacking a new shadow minister so raucously in this place. What mem I would only recommend to members as to be careful what they say in this place. The written, the written, the written you, the, the, written, the, written word, the written word that you, you have in your speeches on Never this very lines. important address on inflation 
is, is the words that will stay in the Hansard. Yeah. And you don't want to be in a position where you've stepped in something you want to walk away from when you leave this House. Order. Yeah. Member for Lyons. Order. Order. Uh, Order. The, uh, the member is waffling about nothing, trying to lecture me. Trying to lecture me, Mr Deputy Speaker. I, uh, I would suggest that you bring him back to the motion before the chair. I'll call on the member for Mellon if he can address the motion. Thank you. To the motion before the chair and responding to those speakers who have spoken before me. And there is a warning in this that they, they are coming into government at a time when the Howard government, and particularly Peter Costello, have a proud record of, uh, of delivery of service, particularly in this House. Those gains were hard won by the Howard government. They did not come easily, as I said before. The first three years of pulling the financial and, fi and fiscal policy of the government into order, of the nation into order, were very hard. And there would be those in this place that know there were some of us on this side of the House that paid a very dear price for getting this nation's house in order when it came to finances. No, well, no, I'm saying there were, I was one of those people that paid the price for the cuts that we had to make, and it was very difficult to get planned at that time. But those cuts were made, and that's what drove down inflation. That's what drove down unemployment. And it's very important because these decisions that we make as a parliament and you as as a new government, uh, uh, they they are they are issues that affect, as some of the members have reflected on, individual families in their own homes. So it's very important that. It's too early to criticise the new government for anything that they might have done at this stage, because they have a budget to produce. They will be putting themselves on the line in that budget as to how they're going to tackle the big issues of the day of skills shortages, which we all recognise in a booming economy, in a Rolls-Royce economy. There will be skills shortages. And it doesn't matter what industry you go to, whether you go to daring or building, especially the building industry. I know in parts of uh, Gippsland they could do with, with uh, 60 plumbers in just one area. There's a shortage of electricians, and we, we know those things. There's going, there are skills shortages. We recognise that, driven out of a strong economy. But, the, uh, but it doesn't help the nation when the treasurer of the country says the inflation genie is out of the bottle. So therefore, the, the unions have, will be responding to that and say, well, if the inflation genie is out of the bottle, everything's going to go up. Well, we're going to, to, we're going to have to apply for more wages here. Yeah, we can, we can be restrained as politicians and have our wages frozen. It's a symbolic act. No one's going to fight about that. Let's get on with the job. But, important, but importantly, wages need to be restrained in this booming economy. There are, and there are shortages throughout the nation, as you would know, Mr Deputy Speaker, coming from the West, which is important to you. The shortages in the mining industry are manifest. And I know there are people being, being hauled— being, being hauled, out of, being hauled out of Gippsland just to drive trucks in the west. You know? uh, so we, we have a shortage of truck drivers now in our area, and these things are crucially important because they affect the whole of the nation. So pretty soon the levers that Paul Keating had, that he said he can just pull and turn at any time, being inflation, the, un the unemployment, all the things that he said, I've got the levers of the nation in my hand, he said. I've got the levers, and then he handed them over to Peter Costello. And Peter Costello handled those levers on behalf of this nation very carefully for a long time. Right now, those levers have gone into the hands of Wayne Swan, and the nation will be looking very carefully as to how he holds them. Order. The, the debate is adjourned, and the resumption of debate will be made and ordered the day for the next sitting. Uh, yeah. Clark? Uh, private members' business, notice number four, motion relating to ministerial accountability. Well, in view of the fact that uh, the member for Ryan is not here, I'll call on the member. I'll call on the member for Fadden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, I ruse, ruse, move to uh, move the motion of acknowledging support for the advancement of democracy around the world, including in Pakistan, Sorry. Member and to recognise— Order. 
Order. The member from Maribyrdong on a point of order. Well, po point of order, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The motion was moved in the name of um, the member for Ryan, and it appears that he's a tardy timekeeper, and under work choices he would have lost his job. But um, we'd need some guidance. As, like, who's running the opposition, and what is their procedures, and who's speaking? Another member other than this. I, uh, I ask indulgence of the House to allow the member for Ryan to introduce the motion, as I know the Speaker is on both sides of the House and he has, uh, has arrived. So if I can seek indulgence and call the member for Maribyrn. Yeah, no, leave screen. Thank you. I call on the member for Ryan. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, and I uh, move the motion uh, on the notice paper in my name. I thank the House for its indulgence, and uh, I want to take this opportunity in this uh, first fortnight of uh, the sittings of the Federal Parliament, the 42nd Parliament of Australia, to uh, extend very warm congratulations to members of both sides uh, that have given their maiden presentations in this Parliament, and uh, to wish them well in their parliamentary career. It's, um, it's interesting that uh, in this 42nd Parliament uh, we are sitting in uh, an historic uh, time of the world, and the part of my motion uh, goes to some of the historic uh, moments that have happened in the last uh, few days and this week, and uh, as well in the uh, week preceding. Um, it's, this motion is uh, very relevant and very timely, I think, because uh, around the world we have seen uh, the creation of, uh, new, of, of a new state, of a new nation state. Uh, we have seen uh, elections in uh, a country of immense importance in the world. We have seen, of course, uh, the elections take place in Pakistan, uh, a nation of the Commonwealth, uh, a good friend of this country, and uh, a, a country with which we have uh, very uh, warm and generous and strong ties. And uh, as well, we of course see uh, happening in the United States a very robust conte contest, a, a contest where uh, candidates for the highest office in that country are pitching their ideas against each other, uh, pitching their policies and seeking to earn the confidence and the trust of the American uh, public. And why I think uh, this motion is very relevant uh, in this parliament at this time is because, of course, uh, we sit here on a Friday for the first time uh, in a very, very long time. And we sit here on a Friday where the executive uh, is uh, not able to be questioned by members of the opposition, and I'll uh, come to, to, that, uh, to more of that later, and I find that uh, very, 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 very disappointing. But uh, I notice that uh, one of the new members to the parliament, a uh, new member from Maribyrnong, I believe, who uh, I think uh, has, uh, has certainly has a national profile and no doubt uh, seeks, to, uh, seeks to lead uh, this country one day, and as I made in a previous presentation, uh, as I made in a previous presentation in this parliament some years ago when I commented that I expected uh, a fellow Queenslander, the, uh, the now Prime Minister and uh, Victorian, the now Deputy Prime Minister, would be very much uh, watching the back of the then Leader of the Opposition, the then member for Brand. And I suspect that uh, uh, the member at the table, uh, the, mem the, uh, the, the member for Maribyrnong, will be doing the same thing. Um, so uh, I'm pleased to uh, extend Order. my personal, personal good wishes for him and his career as well. I'm sure that he, he will make Order. a fine. Yeah. Oh, the member for Ryan is wandering all over the paddock like Brown's cows, and he should stick to the resolution. <laughs> no relevance where he's going now. The member for Ryan will uh, address the motion. M M Mr. Deputy Speaker, if, uh, if the member for Shorten, if the opposition has any, <laughs> has any difficulty with my presentation, there, I, I'm more than happy for them to, uh, to call a division and seek my, uh, seek my expulsion from the chamber. I mean, this is, this in fact is very, very this interjection by Order. the, uh, by the, sh by the member opposite, by the, sh by Order. the parliamentary secretary, Order. who has hardly had his, uh, hardly been here any time at all. He's already acting Order. like the prime minister. In fact. Order. I'm not shouting loud enough. The government whip and a point of order. Most definitely, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. Most definitely, 
Not only could the member for Ryan fail to get himself to the chamber on time to speak to his motion, yeah, not Potter. only did we on this side of the House give him leave to continue, but he is now flaunting your ruling and what he is saying has absolutely no relevance to the motion before the House. Right, and he point. has been totally disorderly standing up while I'm talking at this time. Yeah. Okay, if uh, I've taken the relevance, point of order. please, Mr. Deputy yes. Speaker. Relevance. I'll call the member of the to for Ryan to be. Mr. Acting Deputy me. Speaker, I find it absolutely hypocritical that the government of the day expects members of the parliament to be sitting here and, and expressing their views and their thoughts and their comments and putting together uh, words of wisdom on behalf of their constituencies. And yet, because the members opposite don't like what we're saying, they stand up on a point of order. I mean, talk about hypocrisy. The Prime Minister of the day is not even in the parliament. The Prime Minister in the par of the day is not even in the parliament. This motion goes to democracy. This motion goes to the capacity of members of the parliament to question the executive, to question the Prime Minister, and he cannot even find himself to be here. Now, now I'm more than happy to be, to, to be here. I'm more than happy to sit here on a Saturday, on a Sunday, on any day of the week. But I find it very, very odd. I find it very, very odd that the Prime Minister is not here. I mean, I might have a question to him. I might have a question to him on behalf of the Ryan electorate. I mean, I was, after all, duly elected by the people of Ryan. I was, I was, I was, I was more than comfortably re-elected by the people of Ryan. And I hear, and I hear, I hear one of the newer members. I hear one of the newer members of the Parliament here, already, already acting, already acting with right, the absolute a, a arrogance, less, uh, absolute arrogance chamber, of, of, of a, a man who has in fact been here only a short time. Yet he's acting with, with incredible arrogance. I mean, talk about the Sun King. I understand that uh, he's a member for Longman, the man that I'm looking at, and I understand that he, uh, uh, you know, was. I, I, I certainly congratulate him on his election to the Parliament. But uh, I find it remarkable. Order. I've certainly, in the spirit of generosity, Order. in the spirit of democratic, robust conversation and debate. <laughs> the government chief, the government whip, on a point of order. Ah, yes. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker. Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, the new, the member for Longman is a new member, and it doesn't doesn't relate to the terms of this motion, which is about ministerial accountability, Mr. Oh. Mr. Acting Deputy Speaker, the member for Ryan is flaunting the, your ruling. He is, he is, he is flaunting this. He, I, he is showing his total disrespect order. for this house. Order. I call on the member for Ryan. Uh, Mr. Acting Deputy, well, well, clearly, I think I have the goodwill and the support of uh, members of the Australian public who are sitting in the gallery. Because clearly, wherever they come from around our great country, I welcome member of the National Parliament. You are seeing robust uh, debate in action here. And for those of you who might be for, from Queensland, a particularly warm welcome. Uh, I represent the federal seat of Ryan, and I was. Uh, and this this motion goes to the. My comments, in fact, go to the heart of my motion, because we're talking about democracy. My motion is about democracy. It's about accountability. It's about, it's about the executive being accountable to the parliament. An executive is not here to be questioned. I mean, I cannot get up here now and ask a question to the prime minister of the country. How absolutely absurd! Order. Talk about the sun king from the sunshine state. Order. The member for Lyons at a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker. Point of order. Yes, member for Lyons. Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, there's a motion before the chair. This is uh, uh, backbenchers' time, private members' time. Uh, the uh, member on the other side is trying to introduce uh, a whole issue about uh, other matters into the debate, which was debated here yesterday uh, and somewhat this morning. Uh, we should be debating and giving opportunities for people that want to speak on this motion the opportunity to do so. I would ask member you to bring the member back to, uh, to the motion. I'll call on the member for Ryan. Speaker, um, the, the notice paper motion is about the accountability of the ministers of this government. Where are they? I look around the chamber of the House of Representatives of the 42nd Parliament, and I don't see one single member of the executive here. He's not quite, a, he's not quite the Prime Minister yet. He's not quite the Prime Minister yet. I know that he's from Victoria, and I know that he thinks that the Victorian Member of Parliament of the Labor Party should be the Prime Minister. But right now, the Sun King from the Sunshine State 
is the Prime Minister. And I want him here so I can ask him a question. Why cannot I, on behalf of the Ryan electorate, ask the Prime Minister of Australia a question about issues relevant to the people of my electorate? I want to know all kinds of I, I need to know all kinds of answers from the executive. And I know you I know you seek to be I know you seek to be on the front bench. I know you seek to be on the front bench, but just bide your time, Member for Shorten. Bide your time. There are a lot of people around you, and you might in fact enhance your career if you actually say to the Prime Minister, yes, Prime Minister, we should be here answering questions from the opposition. It's costing taxpayers a million dollars a day for this parliament to sit, and we cannot even ask, we cannot even ask questions of the executive. How absurd, how absolutely absurd, and what, what an affront to the people of Ryan. What an affront to the people of Ryan. One million dollars it's costing the taxpayers of Australia. It's costing every taxpayer of Australia. Order. The member's time has expired. The question is the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Isaacs. Mr Deputy Speaker, we've had from the member for Ryan an absurd rhetorical question today. Why can't I ask a question of the PM? The member for Ryan has not even attempted this year to ask a single question of the PM. We've had two weeks. We've had two weeks of sittings. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, sorry, member for Blacks. I need to call a seconder for the motion. Thank you. I call again the member for Isaacs. What we've I had today from the member. motion be put. I call. The motion be agreed to. I call the member for Isaacs. Sorry. What we've had today, Mr. Deputy Speaker, from the member for Ryan is a continuation of the hysteria, a continuation of the attempt to create a cloud of uncertainty and doubt about a simple change to standing orders when, in fact, there is no uncertainty, there is no doubt, nor is there the slightest change to the accountability of the executive in this place. And I just need to state a few very simple facts about the changes to these standing orders. First, we used to have, under the former standing orders, question time. The member for Ryan on a point of order. Yes, sir, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The, the, uh, the new member to this parliament alleged that I had not asked a question of the Prime Minister. I wonder if he has asked a question of the Prime Minister in the not chamber a point of order. as well. Member for Isaacs. Mr Deputy Speaker, I am not the person complaining, as is the, minute, the member for Ryan, that he can't ask a question of the Prime Minister. And if, I could, if the honourable member would just listen, we, under the former standing orders, sat four days a week. There was question time four days a week. Under the new standing orders, we will sit on the first four days of the week and there will be question time on the first four days of the week. Under the standing orders, under the standing orders, there used to be three matters of public importance debates. Under the new standing orders, there will still be three public importance debates. And can I point out further? Just let's look at the way in which the Parliament has been operating in its first two weeks of operations. Under the life of the Howard government. There was an average of about 18 or 19 questions every question time. Under the first two weeks of the Rudd Labor government, we are averaging more than 20 questions, and that is over the question times that we have had so far. There have been more questions, and that's with the extraordinary interruption and objections that have been attempted by the opposition in these first two sitting weeks. Can I make another point about the way in which this parliament has been operating, Mr Deputy Speaker, and that's this. Under the entire, under, throughout the whole of 2007, the Howard government gave precisely two ministerial statements in this House. In the first two weeks of the parliamentary sittings under the Rudd Labor government, there have been four ministerial statements and there will continue to be ministerial statements used. Mr Deputy Speaker, there have been complaints made both last week and this with all kinds of hysterical statements made about 
the changes to standing orders with a suggestion, first of all, that there was some problem about the uh, quorum requirement imposed in section 39 of the Commonwealth Constitution. And the other point that's been made was some bizarre allegation made by a number of the members opposite that there might be some loss of the absolute privilege, the parliamentary privilege, that attaches to statements made by members in this House. I need to state it clearly, Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no problem in relation to the quorum. All that we have now with the new standing orders that have been introduced to regulate these Friday sittings is a continuation of a practice that has been in place now in this House and, might I add, in the Senate for some years. In relation to parliamentary privilege, it is an absurd suggestion, Mr Deputy Speaker, to suggest that proceedings in this place could in any sense lose the parliamentary privilege that attaches to them because of some imagined point that's being put forward about the quorum requirement. The Speaker made an exceptionally clear statement on the morning of the 20th of February earlier this week as to both points, and that should have put the matter to rest. It didn't because we've seen both yesterday and again today continued complaints um, about the new standing orders that have been introduced. In Indeed, I'm reminded that far from there being an attempt to actually engage in this place, an attempt to put forward some ideas, an attempt to deal with the new policies and the agenda for work that the Rudd government has, all we've had from members opposite is this indulgence, self-indulgence, a concentration on what can only be described as arcane aspects of parliamentary procedure that I would suspect have got no interest to the Australian people. What the Australian people want to see this parliament engaging in is working on the future of this country, putting forward ideas for the future of this country, carrying forward the agenda for work that the Rudd government was elected to fulfil. We had from bizarrely yesterday from the member for North Sydney the suggestion that the changes to standing orders, he said um, in extraordinary terms, cuts to the heart of the Westminster system. The changes to the standing orders say nothing about the Westminster system. They do not change the accountability in this place of ministers. They do not change the way in which this parliament can work. And the suggestion that has been faintly and incoherently raised today by the member for Ryan that the standing orders in some way have lessened ministerial accountability in this place is simply wrong. I had expected, Mr Deputy Speaker, on reading the motion uh, that we might hear something about Pakistan, because Pakistan is, of course, mentioned in this motion, which reads uh, it's, a, it's a motion that the House acknowledges its support for the advancement of democracy around the world, including Pakistan. We haven't heard a word about the advancement of democracy around the world, including Pakistan. Order. Member for Ryan. Yes, Ottawa. point of order. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would have been able to talk about Pakistan if the members opposite had allowed me to and That's stopped interjecting all the time. That is not a point of order. Mem Member for Isaacs. This government, as the Foreign Minister has made absolutely clear, strongly supports a return to democratic processes in Pakistan and the holding of elections. And the holding of elections. And it is hoped that the elections that we have just had in Pakistan will produce workable government and an early return to full democracy in Pakistan. I'm going to assume charitably that the member for Ryan would in fact support that sentiment, even though we heard nothing from him about that. It is ironic, Mr Deputy Speaker, to hear from members on the other side a motion that asks this House to recognise the importance of ministerial accountability in our Westminster system of government. Be in no doubt, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
that the Labor Party, we on this side of the House, fully recognise the importance of ministerial accountability. The shame is that the former government did not. And I don't have time, regrettably, Mr Deputy Speaker, to give you what would be a very long list of the failure on the part of the former government to pay even the slightest attention to, to use the words of the motion, the importance of ministerial accountability. I need only remind honourable members, let's go back to perhaps 2004, that's probably uh, far enough. If we go back to 2004, um, I could remind the House of the former member for Dawson when she was the Minister for Veterans Affairs. She was found to have breached the ministerial code of conduct. That's the former government's own ministerial code of conduct when she employed a former lobbyist, Ken Crook, before annou announcing a grant of $1.27 million to the company where Crook had previously worked. There was no accountability, Mr Deputy Speaker, because the Minister for Veterans Affairs, the former member for Dawson, remained in her post. I could mention, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Australian Wheat Board disaster. No minister answered for that shame in Australia's history. I could mention, I could mention Mr Deputy Speaker, what occurred in relation to the history of maladministration of the Immigration Department under not one but two ministers for immigration. It was year after year after year of mismanagement, ministerial mismanagement, where we saw Australian citizens Order. deport. Order. The member's time has expired. Uh, the question is, the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Fadden. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to talk to the motion of acknowledging support for the advancement of democracy around the world, including in Pakistan, and to recognise the importance of ministerial accountability in our Westminster system of government. Churchill's famous dictum that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time, is indeed correct. It was delivered in the Commons on Remembrance Day 1947 and was fitting at the post-war time it was delivered. I contend it remains fitting today. Churchill had won the war, but in the election of 45 he was defeated, seen not as the man to organise the peace. When the news came out, Churchill was taking a bath. He remarked, they have a perfect right to kick me out. That is democracy. He returned to power, of course, in 1951, but note that the remark about democracy was made when he'd lost. And that's the wonderful nature of democracy. When only the gentle hum of shredders fill the thick, disappointed ministerial air once people have voted for a change, that is democracy. When the sounds of gunfire are absent, when high court judges can sleep well at night, not fearing their door being kicked in and themselves dragged off to prison in front of their children, that is democracy. When people live in freedom, with freedom of speech, of assembly and thought, that is democracy. It may well be the worst form of government, Mr Churchill, but it's the best of the worst, and I welcome the return to democracy in Pakistan. The Westminster system of parliamentary democracy was inherited by Australia. In a country, it's fashioned around citizens electing a parliament and all being governed by one rule of law, a system of checks and balances as the historical absolutist monarchies crumbled to ensure that a system prevailed. Separating powers into three branches, parliament elected by citizens, the executive branch, known as the crown of ministers, cabinet, public servants administering the law passed by parliament, the third branch, the judiciary, which cannot make laws. Its role is purely judicial. But it's interesting to note that neither the prime minister nor the cabinet are mentioned in the Australian constitution. The framers of the constitution took their existence for granted as they did the various conventions of the Westminster system of government inherited from the United Kingdom. Within our great democracy, guided by our Westminster tradition, ministerial accountability is paramount. The government standard of ministerial ethics, Exhibit A, Mr Deputy Speaker, 
states in the very first bullet point of the forward, the very first bullet point, that lobbyists will be required to register their details publicly on a register of lobbyists before seeking access to ministers or their offices. The very first bullet point. Section 8.2 further says that this register will be available online. I've tried to find it online, Mr Deputy Speaker, and you can imagine my surprise when I couldn't. So I had my staff call the office of the Prime Minister, indeed at 11.05am this morning, and they said they'll call us back. And at this time they still haven't called back. Perhaps they're on a rud day off like the Prime Minister. This is despite Senate estimates on the 18th of February, four days ago, revealing that there are no rules in relation to meeting with lobbyists in advance of the register being established. Indeed, Labor actually refused to answer the Senate estimate question about how they will define lobbyists or what constitutes a meeting with the lobbyist. This government can't even get the very first bullet point of their standards of ministerial ethics right. I warn the Australian people here this morning that we are in for three very dark years of misery as this Labor administration follows the other state Labor governments on the slippery path of moribundness. Exhibit A also says in 3.1 that ministers must be able to demonstrate they have taken all reasonable steps. There is a typo. Their preposition to is missing. It should say able to demonstrate. I seek leave, Mr Deputy Speaker, to table this shoddily written document to allow the Prime Minister, whose signature I'm sure is on it, to fix it up before they embark on their education revolution. Seek leave to table the document. Leaves the record. Like the missing preposition, the Prime Minister and most of his ministers are indeed missing Order. with the, the preposition. Member's time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Werriwa. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and let me congratulate you on your elevation to, to the job. But, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, can I just say I actually put myself down uh, on this speaking list because I thought this was a serious motion. The motion I saw and uh, I wanted to speak to is the, uh, the support of a, a advancement of democracy around the world, including Pakistan. And, uh, and goes on to talk about uh, ministerial accountability in the Westminster system. Now, that's something I, th I feel quite passionate about, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, and I, I thought it was wonderful uh, to see that uh, the Pakistani elections took place without the, uh, the spectre of the carnage that we've seen recently in, in uh, that country. And we do hope that what is going to emerge is a solid uh, a democracy over there. It does appear, Mr Deputy Speaker, it will be a coalition. I hope it's not a coalition as rabble as this one over here. I hope it's more, more, more sound in that respect. But it will be a coalition of power uh, that will, uh, will be uh, uh, running uh, the government in Pakistan, and uh, it's something to look forward to. I also thought uh, the mover of this motion might wanted to talk about our youngest democracy in East Timor and the threat that that democracy has had in recent times, Mr Deputy Speaker. The fact that uh, attempts are made on the life of both the president and the, uh, the prime minister of that country, or the fact that we have uh, in the vicinity of a thousand troops presently in East Timor and a hundred police, and I feel quite passionate about that, having regard that I was part of the original negotiations negotiating uh, uh, the Australia's police contingent uh, when it went to uh, East Timor some uh, some time back, and uh, to see the efforts that. Uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that has been uh, performed by Australian servicemen and police officers in furthering the interests in democracy and fighting the challenges and the threats to democracy uh, in what is uh, one of our nearest neighbours but is one of the world's uh, youngest democracies. But no, no that's not what uh, the member wanted to talk about, Mr Deputy Speaker. He wanted to get in and raise issues uh, that we spent many, many hours debating on the first sitting of this parliament. I don't know if people can remember or not. Maybe they'll comatose at that stage. But uh, on the first day of Parliament, Mr. Deputy Speaker, let me remind you, we sat through to 2am. Uh, I think just about most people on the other side of the Parliament decided to participate in that debate. Uh, they put their position forward, and, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, they lost the numbers. They just didn't win the motion. We have had now question time after question time, and all they wanted to do 
not talk about the issues of state, not talk about uh, issues uh, uh, affecting the interests of people and their electorates. All they wanted to talk about, in a, in a roundabout way, Mr. Deputy Speaker, how can they possibly get out of being here on Fridays? Now, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't mind being here on Friday. I don't mind being here with the opportunity of talking about uh, uh, the interests of uh, the people of, of Werriwa or, uh, or the people of MacArthur or, quite frankly, any other, one, other people in southwest of Sydney that uh, need, need some assistance, need to have their, their views ventilated in this place. I know there might be some difficulty for the member for MacArthur expressing their views, since he, I understand he's now referred to as the Mayor of Mossman, but uh, um, uh, that might be something for uh, the member for Baringa to have to uh, deal with. But, but Mr Deputy Speaker, um, this is what the Friday sitting is about, primarily to be able to allow backbenchers to discuss uh, and bring forward Order. matters concerned their local electorate. Order. And what the uh, time allotted for this debate has expired. I was only getting to the good part, though. <laughs> the debate is uh, adjourned, and the resumption of the debate will be uh, made an order of the day for the next sitting. The member has been interrupted and has leave to continue speaking when the, the debate is resumed. Clerk. Members' business notice number five, motion relating to the 75th anniversary of the Ukrainian fam famine. Call on the member for Melbourne Ports. Thank you uh, uh, very much, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. I rise with great sadness to speak on this resolution, uh, a resolution that must be very painful for members of the Ukrainian Australian Sorry. community uh, who remember uh, one of the great crimes of Stalin um, in the period of Soviet communism. Uh, yes, I seek leave to move the motion. Um, who um, was responsible for the death of between eight and ten million uh, citizens of his own country who li live in uh, what is now a free country, uh, Ukraine. Any of us who read uh, <coughs> the great book of that great professor Robert Conquest, The Harvest of Sorrow, uh, one of the great books about the uh, period of Soviet communism, understand uh, exactly the nature of the crimes that were perpetrated against the Ukrainian people. I must say my experiences of this begin in the 1970s when I met uh, the Ukrainian mathematician Leonid Plush, who was one of the dissidents from um, uh, Ukraine who managed to get out and who was brought to Australia again by someone who I've become a great friend of, uh, Dr Michael Lariski, who is uh, a leading financial expert now. but. Um, who was uh, then one of the young leaders of the Ukrainian community. And, um, this began my journey of discovering exactly what happened in the Ukraine in those periods. It seemed uh, that Stalin, uh, in the period of complete power, uh, in the probably equal worst paradigm of a totalitarian state, decided what he was going to do was to eliminate categories of people who might be a threat to him. The Kulaks, the peasants of the Ukraine who were the breadbasket of uh, Russia, uh, were a category of people as private producers who had been encouraged to production after uh, the new economic program uh, of the early part of the Soviet Union were considered such people. And under the dreadful commissar of the Ukraine, Lazar Kaganovich, who died unfairly in his bed, age 92, just a few years ago, um, the mass starvation program was begun. Exports from, uh, the, uh, of wheat from the Ukraine were increased. Um, people were not fed. Production was increased uh, completely unrealistically. Um, people were not, were not fed. And as news of the famine uh, spread uh, beyond the breadbasket of the Soviet Union, of what was then the Soviet Union, various uh, um, people were brought in to write stories about uh, the kinds of Potemkin villages that uh, Stalin wanted them to know, to know about. And there was an infamous writer for the New York Times called Walter Durante, who wrote, um, uh, in fact, got a Pulitzer Prize for saying that there was no, no uh, famine in the Ukraine. He is the only person, uh, uh, acting speaker, who's been stripped of his Pulitzer Prize uh, subsequently because of what people discovered happened uh, in that benighted area at that time. 
These reforms undertaken uh, after the Bolshevik Revolution stemmed from uh, the move to collectivise farms into kolkhoz, kolkhoz or state farms um, and deprive people not just of their livelihood but actually of food with which to live. Uh, there are terrible examples of what happened during the Holmador, uh, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, people actually were said to be involved in cannibalism. Uh, the starvation was so uh, widespread. Seven to ten million Ukrainians, as I said, uh, perished as a result of the famine, uh, while um, Ukrainian wheat was uh, exported uh, to earn foreign exchange for uh, the USSR. It was not mere indifference of the Soviet apparatus to its own people. This was an exercise that was understood and advanced at a macro level by the then uh, Soviet leadership um, <coughs> as an, a, 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 an early example of, of ethnic cleansing. Uh, to this end, uh, the quotas, as I said, for Ukrainian grain production were increased by excess of 40 per cent, but all of the, um, the fruits of the hard-working farm labourers was taken for uh, the Red Army, guarded by the NKVD and the Legion of other um, Soviet security agencies. The grain of these st starving farmers uh, who worked so hard uh, was guarded and kept under lock and key uh, as the farmers and their families died. Internal travel controls were implemented to prevent movement in areas where food was comparatively more plentiful, further compounding the suffering of ethnic Ukrainians in the northern Caucasus Order. and the lower Volga in particular. The member's time has expired. I call for a seconder for the motion. Thank you. I call on the member for Keon. To second the motion uh, moved by the member for Melbourne Ports, and I'd like to recognise the initial work done on this motion by the member for Reid. I'd also like to, to recognise members of the Australian Federation of Ukrainian Organisations who are in the gallery. Mr Deputy Speaker, the 1932-33 Holodomor Moore. Uh, the death by hunger of an estimated 7 million Ukrainian people, more than a fifth of that nation's population, is a tragedy of such a magnitude that can only move us to a sadness that is essentially beyond words. The Great Ukrainian Famine was a man-made horror of a kind and of a scale of a kind and of a scale that was inconceivable before the 20th century. The horror belongs to the legacy of that century, and from it we learn the consequences of not only political ambition, which has been and always will be with us, but of political and ideological ambition mobilised by the power of a totalitarian state. When Nikita Khrushchev denounced Stalin's crimes at the 1956 Com Communist Party conference, he said that Stalin had wanted to deport all Ukrainians, all 30 million of them but they could not find a location for their resettlement. The political scientist Yaroslav Belinsky recalls that, in 1932, Stalin had no illusion that he could exterminate all the Ukrainians at once, but by killing approximately one-fifth of all the Eastern Ukrainians, he made a good start in turning into a more submissive, denationalised uh, people into sowers of millet and hewers of wood. Belinsky asks, is this not genocide? For too hard too long, the world has failed to recognise the Ukrainian famine as genocide. We have failed to realise that in the year of 1932-33, the Soviet policy forced collectivisation created an unprecedented and horribly unsustainable crop failure in the breadbasket of Europe, that the regime punished starving men, women and children alike with execution or deportation for stealing so much as a handful of grain from the collective, that the very seeds were taken from the hands of the planters and the borders were barred against those who tried to flee, and that in the end the deaths of mil millions were defended as a successful ex execution of a policy assembly. The world failed to respond. As the Ukrainian ambassador to the United Nations, Valery Krushinsky, stated in December 10, 2003, in 1933 the international community believed the cynical propaganda of the Soviet Union, which was selling bread abroad while in the Ukraine, the hunger was killing 17 people every minute. On that day, Ambassador Krushinsky also informed the General Assembly 
that a joint statement on Holomido signed by 36 delegations and supported by 27 other nation, member states had been issued. The statement recognised the national tragedy caused by the cruel actions and policies of a totalitarian regime. Mr Deputy Speaker, I wish to acknowledge the significance of the 2003 motion moved by Senator Bill Heffernan in the Australian Senate. The motion acknowledges the 70th anniversary of the enforced famine, recognised that it constituted one of the most heinous acts of genocide in history and honoured the memory of those who died. Mr Deputy Speaker, this motion recalls the 7 million Ukrainians who starved to death as a result of Stalin's policies and the millions more amongst whom were intelligentsia, religious leaders and politicians who died in the subsequent purge. It is a motion of remembrance and honour. It is a motion that joins the Ukrainian people and Ukrainian Australians in commemorating this tragedy. It is a mo motion that asks the Australian Government to support a resolution to the United Nations General Sem Assembly that Holomidor in the Ukraine from 1932-33 be recognised as an act of genocide against the nation of the Ukraine and its people. I commend the motion to the House. The member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. De Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I rise to support this motion as well, but before I do, I'd like to welcome members of uh, the Ukrainian community who are here in the gallery today uh, on behalf of uh, the member for Kuyong, the member for Melbourne Ports and all other members of parliament here. Um, as I said, I rise to support this motion with all sincerity. Humility Order. and uh, this is ongoing an sorrow, perplexed, for the House. perplexed by all the too evident uh, human ability to show astonishing disregard for human life, um, to deliberately, purposefully, and even comfortably administer death, irreversible Order. and eternal, uh, to tens, hundreds of thousands, uh, millions, and tens of millions of uh, Ukrainians and our fellow human beings. Um, I also rise to acknowledge the 75th anniversary of the uh, Hollandomore the great Ukrainian phantom of uh, 1932 to 1933. Uh, it was a genocide orchestrated by the then Soviet leadership of Joseph Stalin for the decimation and subjugation of a people uh, for the theft of their land, the fruit of their toil, their hope of a future and any chance to live. The Soviet claimed as state property the Ukraine's farming land and its produce on which Ukrainians uh, relied to live. Uh, Ukraine's breadbasket was targeted uh, for state theft. Uh, it was exported and dumped in Europe. Stalin's policy of bleeding every last head of grain from the regions literally left the local populations to starve. Ukrainians uh, showing due regard for their own survival, spiriting away and hiding what food they could find for themselves and their families if caught with the so-called state property were sent to uh, show trial, Siberia or executed. The Soviet exploitation of the Ukraine's harvests was devastating. The three harvests of 1931 to 1933 produced 18.3, 14.6 and 22.3 million tonnes of grain, easily enough to feed the population but not enough to satisfy both the demands of the Kremlin and the needs of the Ukraine people. Millions of Ukrainians died of starvation as a result. Sources vary in the estimation. Uh, perhaps 7 million or 8 million in 1932 to 1933. Stalin told Churchill once of 10 million dying, and it is suggested that up to 14 million died in the uh, six years to 1937. Survivors' accounts conjure up uh, mental images of uh, food uh, confiscators returning again and again to deprive, deprive families of identifiable sustenance. Um, stories of children slowly and painfully uh, assuming uh, gargle characteristics of bodies swollen with hunger and leaking fluid, of bodies lying in the street wrapped in blankets, town after town, region after region, millions after millions. It is suggested that throughout the 20th century Ukraine lost 50 million human souls, almost as many as all of those lost in World War II, more than the Ukraine's total pop current population, and equal to two deaths for every man woman and child currently uh, resident within uh, Australia. Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, such uh, figures surely put uh, uh, Hollandemore as one of the most heinous events in human history. So uh, I support the motion before the House in honour of the lives of the millions who were murdered by the Soviet state 
and to honour the uh, Ukraine nation that continues to mourn their deaths and to encourage all peoples and nations to identify the need for such human-induced uh, horrors to be remembered as genocide. And I support uh, that such evil acts are identified within the context of the United Nations General Assembly, should the opportunity uh, uh, arise. Um, so, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the Parliament should note that uh, 2007 marks Order. the 75th the anniversary of the Great UK Ukrainian Phantom, um, known as uh, Hollande Moor of 1932 to 33 which was caused by the deliberate actions of Stalin's communist government uh, of the uh, then uh, Union of so so Soviet Socialist Republics. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, there are many, many Ukrainians who found their way to Australia and have made their home here in Australia. Uh, many of them uh, uh, had no hope of survival or had uh, no hope of seeing a better future in their homeland. And we see many Australian Ukrainians today that have gone on to uh, uh, make a commitment to this land and uh, certainly uh, um, contribute to this great multicultural country that we call home here in Australia. And uh, I suppose this uh, motion marks uh, also their astonished deeds of uh, leaving their homeland under such uh, tremendous uh, um, po poverty at the time the and, and destruction. Time and I'd like to acknowledge all those people. Inspired. The member for Riverina. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to support this motion and to remember the crime committed on the people of Ukraine. After years of chaos and conflict and battles for ownership of the Ukraine, in 1921 those battles ended with a Soviet victory led by Lenin. The Soviets immediately began shipping out huge amounts of grain to feed the hungry people of Moscow and other Russian cities and deprived the people of the Ukraine of the food that they had grown with their own hands. If Ukrainians thought that Lenin was a monster at that time, then they hadn't seen anything yet. When Lenin, when Lenin died in 1924, Stalin, one of the most ruthless humans ever to hold power, succeeded him. To Stalin, the burgeoning national revival movement and the continuing loss of Soviet influence in the Ukraine was admit completely unacceptable. Stalin immediately imposed the Soviet system of land management known as collectivisation, and this resulted in the seizure of all privately owned farmlands and stock. In the Ukraine, once proud village farmers were by now reduced to the level of a rural factory worker on large collective farms. Anyone refusing to participate in that compulsory collectivisation system was simply denounced as a kulak and deported. The people simply refused to become cogs in that Soviet farm machine and remained rightly stubbornly determined to return to their pre-Soviet farming lifestyle. In Moscow, Stalin responded to their unyielding defiance by dictating a policy that would deliberately cause mass starvation and result in the deaths of millions. By mid-1932, nearly 75 per cent of the farms in the Ukraine had been forcibly collectivised and there were mandatory quotas of foodstuffs being shipped out to the Soviet Union, and they were drastically increased. There was simply no food remaining to feed those people in the Ukraine. All food was considered to be the sacred property of the state. Mothers in countrysides would sometimes toss their emaciated children into passing railway cars travelling towards cities such as Kiev in the hope that someone would take pity. However, in the cities we had children and mums and adults who had already flocked there from the countryside. The they Riverina. were dropping dead in the streets. It being 12.40, the debate is interrupted in accordance with Standing Order 41. The debate is adjourned and the resumption of the debate will be made in order of the day for the next sitting. The member will have leave to continue speaking when the debate is resumed on a future day. I call the clerk. Government business. Order of the day number one, grievance debate. Does anyone have a grievance? I do, Deputy Speaker. The member for Cowper. Deputy Speaker, I grieve for the people in my electorate because of the 150 jobs that have gone as a result of the, the failure of the government to proceed with the Centrelink call centre. This government alleges that it is concerned for the people of Australia. This government alleges that it is concerned to create opportunities, but in fact what we have is we have a regional area with high unemployment, with great need, 
and they curtail a project that was going to create great benefits. It was going to create great benefits not only for the people who receive those jobs, but it was going to create great benefits for Centrelink customers. And we all want to provide better services for the customers of Centrelink. How can failing to upgrade our call centres provide better services for the people who need it from Centrelink? It's a pure hypocrisy by the people on the other side to say they cl claim to care for the people who use Centrelink services, but at the same time fail to proceed with an important upgrade, fail to, fail to allow jobs to be created in regional areas, an upgrade of our call centre services, faster, more efficient services. We hear all the time in our electorates that people want better services for Centrelink, and the previous government was committed to deliver that. But in its first action, its backsides barely on the Treasury benches, and they cut services to Centrelink. They cut the ability of Centrelink to provide for the people whom they are supposed to uh, look after. It's an absolute disgrace, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's an absolute disgrace, and I can't believe, particularly these new members opposite, how does the member for Bass feel to come into this place? And her first legacy in coming into this place is to deliver the she's loss of a, she's, she's not, not even not here, here to Where deliver the loss of jobs here. in her electorate. I can see I can see her newsletter now, she's Mr. Playing. Deputy Speaker. 150 now. jobs slashed from Bass. Here, here. I, hear, I see the members opposite cheering 150 jobs lost in Bass as well as the 150 jobs lost in my electorate of Cowper. It's a disgrace, Mr Deputy Speaker, and these expansions of call centres in regional areas make sense for a range of reasons. They make good economic sense as well as good service delivery sense, because we have in regional areas a supply of labour available, available to do a range of tasks, but currently in many cases underemployed. But a call centre would draw on a currently perhaps underutilised labour force. But what do we have this government doing? It's not creating opportunities in regional areas. It's not looking to improve the unemployment uh, situation in regional areas. What we have them doing is ripping jobs out of regional Australia. And the member for Bass didn't bother to front on the RDO. I'm here putting the case forward for my electorate. The Prime Minister's not here. The Prime Minister isn't here. We want the Prime Minister here. The member for Cowper will resume his seat. The member for Cowper will resume his seat. The member for Cowper will resume his seat. The member for Cowper will remove himself from the House under Standing Order 94A for ignoring my call. And, and I call the, the leader of the House. Thanks, thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. As the leader of the opposition, as the leader of the opposition knows, the prime minister is today visiting indigenous communities in Walgett and then visiting flood victims in Mackay. In Mackay, that is what the prime minister is doing today, and this extraordinary breach of the protocols of this house. The that the member here the is continuing on. I ask that you take action on this disorderly conduct. The Leader of the House, the member for Warringah. I presume, Mr. S Madam Speaker, you're about to sit him down no, because I'm that was not, that was not a point of order. No, I'm about to ask the member to remove himself no. and that no, from I'm the sorry. House. No, Madam I am a, no, I've asked the member. I've asked the member for Canning to remove that from the House. I. No, no. You know, so do I. I'm in the chair, and you will hear me. And you haven't heard me. I'm actually in the chair, and I will be heard. Under previous, under previous rulings, such articles have been asked to remove from the House. I'm asking the member for Canning to remove that from the House. I haven't made for the member for North Sydney. I haven't made a ruling. I've asked. I've asked for the uh, offensive article for the article to be removed. For the article. For the article. For the article.
expensive. That is a, for the article to be removed from the House. Sit down. Sit down. The leader of the House, the leader of the House, will resume his seat. And I, I'm on my feet. I'm on my feet. You're not helping the member for Werriwa. I am on my feet. I have asked for that to be removed, and it will be done so. The member for North Sydney. Madam Deputy Speaker, yesterday the Speaker of this Parliament said, and I quote, the use of props is not encouraged, but it is tolerated. And we have had all week the Deputy Prime Minister coming into this place with props. The member for North Sydney. If your own Prime Minister. The member for North Sydney. The leader of the House. The member for Paterson. The leader of the House. Perhaps, Madam Deputy Speaker, given that the leader of the opposition gave a commitment. A commitment on behalf of the opposition just an hour ago that we would have private members proceeding. We can proceed with it now and stop the nonsense. Clear the house. Order. The member for North Sydney. Madam Deputy Speaker, to provide absolute clarification to the house, we have had the Deputy Prime Minister introduce props to the house during the course of debate, and yesterday, and yesterday. I have a right the to be heard yesterday, Madam Deputy Speaker. What's the point of order? Yesterday, in a debate before this order. chamber, order. The, the Leader order. of the House. The Member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The Leader of, order. of the House. Well, what is this? On what, basis, on what basis order. does the Member for North the Sydney. The Leader of the House will be heard in silence. On what basis does What's the Member for North Sydney have the call? The Member for North Sydney on a point of order? Oh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the point, point, of order the point of order is? is to remind the chair of the chair's words yesterday. Of the chair's words yesterday, the, the Sydney, use of props is not encouraged, but it is tolerant. Sydney the simple will point is, his seat. We don't want to have the member for North Sydney will resume his seat. The member for Calpa. We have questions. Thank you, Deputy Cowper. Speaker, because. My people have the right to expect their government is here to hear their concern. To the expect their Cowper will resume his seat. He's on grievance. I've called him on on grievance. And I, sorry, and I will. I have actually asked the member for Cowper to remove himself from the chamber, as he did ignore my rulings before. I did, and I let it go on. But I actually did ask the member for Cowper under 94A. The members will resume their seat. I had called him and I was going to remind him. I had let it go on, but I actually asked him to remove himself from the chamber because, because he had been ignoring the chair. On what basis? On the basis that I'm in the chair and at the time you're ignoring the chair. I asked you to remove yourself under 94A. Please remove yourself from. I'm well, I, and I let it go on. And now I'm asking you and your feet to remove. No, you do not have the call. You remove yourself under 94A. The member. Go, go. Leader of the House. Mr. The Speaker. member is named. The member is named. I move, I move that the member be suspended from the House. Division? The, the question is that the motion be agreed to. All those opinions say aye. aye. Against? No. Is division required? Yes. In accordance with Standing Order 113, the division is referred until the commencement of the next sitting. The member will remove himself from the chamber. 94A, you do not have the call. The member, I am you are. You are, but you're not entitled to yell at me until I give you the call. The member for Arunga. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, 
There has been no so, resolution just, of the can House. I just ask you to sit down. The member for Gilmore will remove herself from the chamber on the basis that I found that offensive and a reflection on the chair. The member for Warringa. Uh, no, come on. There, there has, no, my, please, please resume your seat. I will call the member for Warringa when the member for Gilmore. The member for Gilmore has been in this place long enough to know that she has been reflecting on the chair. The member for Leader of the House. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, since, uh, since Federation, Mr. Speaker, this part, Madam Deputy Speaker, this, this Parliament functions on the basis of respect for whoever is in the chair. Respect for whoever is in the chair. And Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm familiar. I am very familiar with Standing Order 94A. Very familiar, Madam Deputy Speaker, because over the last term, on more than 190 occasions, members of the then opposition were asked to leave the chamber. Not once, not once, the Leader of the House, not once was that questioned. Not once, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I ask the Leader of the Opposition the I ask of the, House, the Leadership Leader of the, the Opposition of the to show leadership. Seat. The Leader of the House will resume his seat. Uh, the Leader of the House will resume his seat. The Member for Warringah. Well, Ma Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker. If we can return to the matter that you were previously dealing with and where you indicated that you would give me the call, the, the point I was raising, the point of order I was raising, is that no resolution of the House has been carried. No resolution of the House has been carried, and on that ground you cannot ask the member for Cowper to remove the himself. The member for Aringa will resume his seat. As was discussed earlier today, you may not be happy with the new standing orders, but they were put in place at the last, at the, the prior to coming into the House today. I am operating under the standing orders as they apply today. The member for Brisbane. On the point of order that was raised by the member for Warringah, he was, I assume, referring to the naming and the suspension that would follow for 24 hours. Prior to that uh, event, uh, you had, quite properly in accordance with Standing Order 94A, requested the member for Cowper to leave the chamber. 94A in part reads, the direction shall not be open to debate or dissent, and if the member does not leave the chamber immediately, the Speaker can name the member under the following procedure. The following procedure, the following procedure was the subject of the division. The prior requirement under 94A for the member for Cowper to remove himself for one hour is not open to debate. And everyone in this chamber knows that, and it has been and it has been obeyed without exception, without exception by anybody, from the time it was inserted under Speaker Martin. And I would therefore suggest that the member for Cowper should remove himself for the hour, as has been the practice ever since that standing order was put in place, without exception. The member, the member for North Sydney. Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker, the member was named. You asked for a vote. The vote on the voices was challenged. A division was called for. No division was held. Therefore, no decision of this chamber has been made. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, the member has a right to be heard. The the, if the North government Sydney, doesn't have the numbers the on the floor of the North chamber, Sydney it should give it to someone else. Seat. The member for Cowper will remove himself from the chamber. The member for Cowper's refusal to leave the chamber places the chair in an untenable position. The sitting is suspended until the ringing of the bells.
Could all members resume their seats? Order. Today's events have been of considerable concern to me. I repeat my earlier statement that I understand that some members have concerns about the arrangements for Friday sittings. I wish to express my full confidence of the work of all occupants of the chair today in what have been difficult circumstances. If our House is to expect the community to have confidence in it, all members should conduct themselves with decorum and dignity, regardless of their views about particular matters, including the conduct of business on future Fridays. The question is that grievances be noted on the basis that time has expired. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Earlier today, the member for Herbert drew the attention of the Speaker to the State of the House. In accordance with Standing Order 55C, I will count the House if the member so desires. desires. I indicate the member for Herbert to indicate whether he requires a count of the House to be taken. The member for Herbert. Uh, Mr Speaker, my request was before lunch and I require this parliament to operate properly. I require, I just, I I require does, a count of the House. Yes, a count. That's right. Quorum present. Order. The House will now adjourn until 2 p.m. on Tuesday, the 11th of March. <laughs>